Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. Let's see, our heads are a little uneven here, Sam. I will fix that. Bam! Now we're even. Now we're even. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are here to talk about Muslim objections to the deity of Christ. This came up. We weren't we weren't planning on this, but I believe it was like early this morning. I got a message from someone who said that his Muslim friends are raising objections to the deity of Christ, and could we go through the passages? Um, I texted Sam, said, free to do this tonight? He said yes, and so here we are. And so this won't take us terribly long to go through the issues on uh, the, the, the verses that this uh, young man brought up. And so we're going to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and... Uh, Invite Muslims to raise more objections to the Please. deity of Christ. Now, now, Sam, could you imagine? Wait, now you're what the heck? Now you're higher up on the screen. You go low, I go. Uh, uh, you go low, I go lower. Then you go back up high. All right, now trying to keep us even here. Otherwise, it looks uh, like it looks like. Otherwise, it looks like I'm lording it over you, right? I actually um, look like I'm higher than you. I don't know. Yeah, just, yeah, because you went up to the top. You were down at the. You were down at the bottom, so I lowered mine. Then you went back up to the top. Stay there. Whatever you do, stay there. All right. Yeah, that's it. I got a position. Now. Hang on, hang on. I can actually uh, zoom in so that we're totally even. I have the technology. I have so much technology. My technology is impregnable. Um, yo, Sam, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Now, now here we are inviting Muslims to bring their objections to our view of Jesus. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Muslims mm. just saying, "All right, we're proclaiming that Muhammad's a prophet. Now bring all your objections to Muhammad. Bring all your objections to the Quran. Just bring them all on." Can't even imagine it, man. They're not gonna do that. Can't they even know imagine. better. The Muslims, yep. the Muslims know better. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. uh, we're saying, come on. One Muslim just comments saying, "Oh, Jesus is just the messenger of Allah." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, better come up with some better, uh, better yeah. arguments than that. Better come yeah. up with some better arguments than that. All right, Sam, I can't help it. You're too high up. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, I haven't moved my computer. I've uh, done nothing. Okay, it's, it's just, the same it's, just position. it's just magically moving. All right. Well, wait. Grace the sinner. Grace the yeah. sinner here says, "Will you also answer objections to the deity of Christ?" Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, that that's the point. point. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point of this program. So, um, I don't know if she meant non-Muslim objections to the deity of Christ, but yes, uh, Grace, we have, uh, we have. I took a screenshot of some verses that a young man said. I'm assuming he's a Christian if he's interested in defending the deity of Christ against Muslim objections. But he said that his Muslim friends bring up these verses. Can someone help him? So I took a screenshot of that. We're about to, we're about to pull that up. I did want to show one thing, Sam, because, hey, Sam. Yeah. Um, remember how we keep saying that these guys don't actually believe in the Quran? They don't believe what their God says. They don't believe what their prophet yep. said. Uh, they're, they're, they're completely ruled and under the control of their feelings. Yes. And they have, they have deified their own feelings and whatever they feel. That's what they, that's what, that's what Islam is. Hey, check this out. Ready? Yeah. Above and All Muhammad's right. wishes. Yeah. So this is a comment. This was the other night when, uh, when there was a Muslim <laughs> challenge, challenging me to take the, the Mubahala, right? I got yeah. to do the Mubahala. We said, dude, I did that years ago. The agreement was that um, I would die within a year and that if I was right, that I would be wrecking Islam and leading many Muslims away from Islam. Um, guess what? I didn't die within the year and I've been wrecking Islam ever since. So yeah. you can either say it's a ridiculous challenge or yeah. you can say uh, it was it was completely in my favor. But But, but check this out. Check out what this Muslim says. <laughs> yeah. K, K. Po says, you took the challenge, but Allah was merciful enough to not kill you. So Allah, in his mercy, did not kill me, even though we had the Mubahala challenge. However, you have been punished by Allah with having two disabled children and your friend Nabil dying at such a young age. Turn back from your blasphemy. Now, now notice, Sam. Because every Muslim we ever run into says, yeah. oh, Christianity is unjust and immoral. Allah would never punish one person for the sins of another. Every single Muslim we run into says that until, until they need to attack me by saying that Allah is punishing me, whereas I'm doing great. And so they have to say, ah, 
but he's going for people around you. You know what I mean? He yeah. went. He went for your. He went for your babies, man. <laughs> he went for your yeah. baby. He could. He couldn't take you out like 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 you guys agreed to. The Muslims and the Christians agreed to in the contract. He couldn't do that. He went after the babies. He went. He punished your babies <laughs> because of you. And he went after Nabil, who's way nicer than you. But he went after Nabil to punish you. So he's being merciful towards me by giving babies a terminal illness and yeah. and killing the bill right so notice yeah. the hypocrisy right if this guy took his religion at all seriously he would have to be saying no allah wouldn't do that allah wouldn't do that instead it's yes allah he just can't get to you he's merciful towards you david but he's he's taking out everyone around you to show you that if he comes after you he doesn't go after you he goes after everyone else to punish you yeah. That's and religion. then he leaves you intact to wreck Islam, destroy Islam, <laughs> expose Muhammad, shame Muhammad, <clears throat> and being the cause, when I say cause, as the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ uses you to see thousands and thousands of Muslims leave Islam. Okay. Yeah, now, now, now <laughs> let, let me apply the same reasoning let me apply the same reasoning that they use on this one issue and then we're and then we'll go ahead and, and jump into uh to uh some objections to the deity of christ but um the same reasoning right we say that jesus died on the cross for sins and muslims respond ah what that would be like god punishing a baby for what a murderer has done right and it's not the same thing. Jesus was not a baby being punished, and he did he he willingly took our punishment upon himself. But notice, even though the situation with Jesus is nothing like what they're saying, what the yeah. Muslim what the Muslims say about me is exactly like that. That that Allah punishes babies for what I've done. Right? This is yeah. amazing. What an amazing religion, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. He can't. Yeah, yeah. He can't get the dizzle, Sam. Allah just can't oh. get the dizzle. He can go after. He can go after babies around me, but he can't get the dizzle. He picks on babies, but not me. Oh, yeah, but like I said, <laughs> and what a terrible job. He goes after your kids, and still, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you're still wrecking Islam, destroying Islam, exposing <clears throat> Muhammad for being <clears throat> the son of Satan that he is. Man, so Allah isn't the sharpest tool in the shed. I thought I wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. Yeah. But glory to Jesus Christ that you're still trucking. And you got what, a hundred million viewers? And even in your live streams, you get over a thousand. We're getting, a, we're getting, we're getting, a, we're getting quite a few. Dude. And, and, and Sam, this is Allah punishing you. All right. And Sam, think about, just think about how <laughs> dumb, how dumb Allah is, according to K. Poe. One of the reasons I don't travel more, right? Because I, I, I could be traveling a lot more. One of the reasons I don't like traveling a lot is because I don't like leaving my wife at home with five kids, who two of whom have disabilities, right? Um, I don't like doing that, so I, I, I kind of only I, I only travel a couple times a month. I could be traveling a lot, be raking in big bucks, but I don't want to do that, so I stay home. But since I stay home all the time, I make more videos. But making more videos is where I'm wrecking Islam. So Allah's like, ah, so here's Allah's plan. Allah, who 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 can foresee the future, supposedly. Allah says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to punish this David Wood with disabled children. Then he's going to end up staying home and making hundreds and hundreds of videos refuting my prophet and leading people out of Islam. This is the great, the wisdom of Allah. And 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 be, beyond, beyond all this, Sam, if we wanted to say this, if we wanted to say, hey, you have, your, your, you have problems with, you know, disability with, with your kids, and uh, that's a sign of Allah punishing you. If we wanted, if we wanted to take that seriously and we look at Muhammad and his children, what would we have to conclude? What would we have that's to conclude? That's exactly what I was thinking, man. I was just thinking the same thing, that if that's a sign of Allah's displeasure and that Allah's cursed someone, Muslims will tell you that none of Muhammad's sons live past the age of being toddlers. None of them. None of them. And even when it came to his daughters, only one outlived him, Fatima, who then died six months later, and she died miserable. So now if that's the case, David, then that means according to K-Po, Muhammad was truly hated by Allah. And then you add to the fact that he died the very shameful cursed death that the Quran says he would die if he's a fake and an imposter. Chapter 60, uh, 69, 44, 47. And then, man, this guy just buried Muhammad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
All right. Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to... There was a comment from a Muslim uh, woman that I wanted to take a look at because um, it would be a good place to start, but I might have missed it. We'll always get back. We'll always get back to it later. Um, if not, give me about another 30 seconds here. Sam, why don't you introduce yourself, and I'll see if I can find yep, that yep. comment again. Tell everyone what yeah, you do. Find it. Well, yeah, even though we want to first say, uh, say we love the Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus, and His Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that you bless this session, invigorate our bodies, <clears throat> strengthen our, our voices, Father, and give us the health we need to glorify the name of Jesus and bless your people and give us the holiness we need to delight your heart, Father. Forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings and bless everyone, even the Muslims, by the might of your spirit to fall in love with the true Jesus and use our meager efforts to glorify your Son, your heart, our God and Savior, our heart, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yes, well, you guys already know who I am. I've been doing this since 1999, writing for AnsweringIslam.net, AnsweringIslam.net. I started a blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, and I've been working with the Dizzle for over, what, 10 years, 15 years, and by the grace of Jesus Christ, the Lord in His mercy has brought up this amazing te team for a time like this because we will be the generation in Jesus' name, this is my hope, in Jesus' name, we will be the generation to see Islam destroy, Islam will collapse, it will be <clears throat> destroyed and brought under the feet of Jesus, and millions of Muslims getting saved by the power of the Holy Spirit, using the internet to glorify Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. So praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, here we have Peter uh, Millich here. He says, uh, someone said that Jesus can't be God because when he died, the universe didn't yeah. cease to it didn't cease to exist. All I, all I can say is that's not how the Holy Trinity works. Um, yeah. so he's someone, I, I'm guessing someone in the chat, uh, made the claim that since, uh, if Jesus was God, then since he died, the universe didn't yeah. cease to exist. So that would make him, uh, that means that he's, he's not God. Um, uh, Sam, just before we, yes. before we get started responding to objections to the deity of Christ, this is something that's going to come up over and over and over yes. again. Muslims are going to go to passages they're going to go to passages and they're either going to ignore the doctrine of the incarnation or they're going to ignore the doctrine of the Trinity and they're going to approach us like we're, we're Unitarians. Yeah, precisely. Uh, they're going to ignore both of those doctrines and then uh, treat Christ and then judge Christianity based on the idea that we don't have these doctrines. Yeah. And yeah. guys, I don't know what you think you're refuting. It's like, it's like Allah when he's uh, trying to attack Christianity and he doesn't know what Christians believe. He has no idea what Christians believe and everything he's saying about Christianity is completely wrong in the Quran. And then his followers, they come and they raise all these objections, but it's all based on misunderstandings, the same misunderstandings that we find in the Quran. And yeah. uh, guys, guys, if you want to refute the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, things like that, at least know what you're talking about so that you can critique the claim accurately and not simply display your yeah. ignorance. What do you think, yeah. Sam? And, and you know what? It's, for, for a Muslim to raise this objection, it shows, I'm going to be charitable and assume that the Muslim who said this is ignorant of the Quran, but for a, a Muslim who's an apologist who knows the Quran, this would be dishonest and trickery. Why? Now, why do I say that, folks? Why do I say that? <clears throat> I know there are Christians who believe in soul sleep. I'm not one of them because I don't believe the Bible teaches it. Now, with that said, neither the Quran nor the Bible, because I want you to understand the implication of the question. The question is, if Jesus died, he ceased to exist. He ceased to be conscious, because that's why the question is, who is running the universe? Who is taking care of the universe? Assumption, if Jesus died, he ceased to be. He ceased to exist. There was secession of life, secession of consciousness. Neither the Quran, and Christians, please listen to this, because I'm going to give you some Quranic passages. Neither the Quran nor the Bible define death, specifically physical death, I'm going to limit it to physical death, as the loss of consciousness, secession of life, ceasing to exist, ceasing to be conscious. What physical death is, implies, both according to the Quran and the Bible, is where the soul, the spirit of the person, leaves their bodies, their bodies then returns to the grave, to the dust, but their souls and spirits, because some people make a distinction between soul and spirit, that's a debate for someone else, <laughs> I don't care if you believe soul and spirit are different or one of the same, irrelevant, but that immaterial aspect of a person 
continues to consciously exist. Now, let me prove it from the Quran, and then I'll prove it from the words of Jesus Christ. Here, <clears throat> as the Lord Jesus strengthens my throat, <clears throat> like I said, I'm not a young man anymore. I did a session earlier, but my voice gives out much quicker, quicker than it used to be. But Holy Spirit, give us the health we need for the glory of Christ. Chapter 2, verse 154, folks. Surah Al-Baqarah 154. And call not those who are slain in the way of Allah dead. Don't say they're dead. Nay, they are living, only ye perceive not. Quran says, those who've been martyred, killed in the way of Allah and jihad, they're not dead, they're alive, even though you don't understand how they can be alive or in what condition, in what sense they're alive. Chapter 3, verse 169 and 170. Chapter 3, verses 169 and 170. Think not of those who are slain in the way of Allah as dead. Don't think of them as dead. Nay, they are living. With their Lord they have provision. Jubilant are they because of that which Allah hath bestowed upon them of his bounty. Rejoicing for the sake of those who have not joined them but are left behind. That there shall be no fear come upon them, neither shall they grieve. So the Quran says those who are physically killed in battle, they're still alive because their spirits and souls are so consciously alive. Well, what does Jesus say about his death? Now pay attention to what our Lord says. John 2, verses 19 to 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So destroy this temple, I will then raise it up. The Jews said, Forty-six years it has taken to build this temple, and you will raise it up? So they understood. You will raise it up. But where they misunderstood, they thought he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. But then John tells us, but this he spoke of the temple of his body. So Jesus was saying, destroy my physical body, which is the temple of God, because God lives in this body. Destroy my body. I will personally raise my body in three days. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. One more passage. John 10, verses 17, 18. <clears throat> John 10, 17, 18. Therefore doth my father love me. Here's one of the reasons why my father loves me. Because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own initiative, of my, my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my father. Now, folks, Jesus could not possibly raise his physical body back to life. And by the way, for the record, I'm not saying Jesus raised his, his physical body independently of the Father and the Spirit. We are Trinitarians, and the Bible affirms. The Father raised Jesus' physical body, Jesus raised Jesus' physical body, and the Holy Spirit raised Jesus' physical body, which is why we're Trinitarians. All three persons working together raised Jesus' physical body back to life. But folks, for Jesus to raise his physical body back to life, to immortality, means he was still consciously alive when his body lay in the tomb, and he was still consciously sustaining creation and his body in the tomb. So what's the problem? Jesus was sustaining the universe with the Father and the Spirit as his body lay in the tomb, because neither the Bible nor the Quran teaches that when a person dies, he ceases to be consciously alive, he ceases to exist. There you go. All right. So, <clears throat> so that was one objection. And then I posted a comment here. Jacob Lambert said, David took the one-year challenge and lived. Muhammad said, my aorta will be cut. And it was. So Muslims, David's your new prophet. In other words, Muhammad failed the test. David would pass the test. So, exactly. And, and notice, Sam, is that going to impress any Muslim? No. Why? They, they don't care about the, they don't care about the evidence, right? <laughs> A, 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 in other words, in other words, if Muslims came out and said, "May God curse the liar," and they all drop dead, it would they would just assume, "Oh, they must have been bad Muslims." Yeah, that would be it. They would explain it away somehow. How do I know? Because we just see them explaining away all evidence, even when they are conclusively refuted. Uh, our good Muslim friend, Make Money, said, uh, "David, do you believe Muhammad existed?" Yes, I believe Muhammad existed. But it is hard to, as someone pointed out, it is hard to argue because of the lack of reliable sources and because uh, the, the Muslim historians that you do have 
are making up stories about Muhammad left and right like it's a sport. So that by the time you get to Bukhari, there are literally hundreds of thousands of stories going around Muhammad that can't be trusted. And, uh, and Muslims calling each other liars. They, they, no matter which person you go to, to learn about Islamic history, you have tons of Muslims saying, don't trust him, he's a liar. It's the biggest bunch of liars the world has ever seen, those early generations of, uh, of Muslims who are passing on information about Muhammad. So, uh, so basically, you just can't trust a lot of what they say unless you can apply some historical principles to their claims. And using principles that historians use, come up with some interesting uh, details. So uh, I believe we can do that. I believe, in other words, I believe that you can take very unreliable uh, historians and still learn things uh, from their from their writings and from their works and stuff. So yes, I believe that Muhammad existed, but mainly because of all the embarrassing material that no one would ever invent about someone. Yeah. Um, all right, Sam, you ready to go into some of these? Sure. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put this up on the screen. And guys, so again, we're going to go through this list. I think it's about four or five Bible passages that he said his Muslim friends were bringing up. Um, I'll I'll tell you what, Sam. I will uh, I'll bring up the claim. We'll go through them one at a time. I'll bring up the claim. I'll tell everyone what the Muslim position on this is, and you tell us you tell us why they've got a problem here if they're using this. All right. So here we have it up on the screen. It's from Vale here in the uh, in the middle. It says, David Wood, my Muslim friends claim that Jesus is not God from those verses from the Bible. And he starts with John 11, 41 to 42. Then he goes to Matthew 11, 25 to 26. That's going to be a problem. Not for Christianity, though. For his Muslim yeah. friends, for his Muslim friends, once he realizes how easy this is to refute. Matthew 27, 46, Mark 15, 34, Luke 23, 46. Now, some of these are actually about the exact same thing. But uh, he says, can someone help me to refute these arguments? All right. Well, let's go ahead and start with John 11, 41 to 42. So John 11, 41 to 42. Oh, yeah, that's that's like mind blowing. They're quoting these passages. I'm really like shocked, dude. I'm seriously right. shocked. So we're you going. Know? So Sam, I've got a, I've got the Bible put up pulled up here. I'm going to read the verse, and we'll see if we can figure out what uh, yeah. what the Muslim is saying here. So I'm going to take yeah. this down, and we'll go ahead and read um, John chapter 11, verses 41 to 42. So John yeah. chapter 11, 41 to 42. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Now, I'm like you, Sam. Why in the world would a Muslim pick that passage? But just to give everyone the context, this is, the, this is with the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, where Jesus calls himself the resurrection and the life. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And then so they take away, the, he, he orders them to take away the stone. And he says, and it says, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. So I guess the point here, Sam, is that yes. Jesus is speaking to the Father. So it looks like once again, we're going we're gonna to assume Unitarianism. One yes. God, one God, one person, and that if Jesus is talking to someone as God, as the Father, yeah. then that must be de simultaneously denying Jesus' own deity because we're Unitarians, one God, one person. Yeah. And yeah. so if Jesus is talking to the Father, I thank you that you've heard me, you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Now, I have to just point out the obvious here. If Jesus is talking to the Father, ladies and gentlemen, then Islam is already false. So the, yeah. the first thing you should be pointing out to your Muslim friends, if they bring a passage like this up, ah, Jesus is talking to the Father. Right. Well, he's not a Muslim then, and Islam is false if you're saying that, that Jesus speaks the truth. If he's referring to his Father, and the Quran says that Allah is a Father to no one in no sense, 
If Allah says that the highest relationship you can have with him is a slave to master relationship and that everyone approaches him as a slave, then Jesus obviously can't be approaching him as the son of the father. Therefore, Islam is false. But Sam, yes. um, what, do you, what do you think about this as a case against the deity of Christ? Yeah, this is actually a nightmare for Muslims because folks, let me finish the the context. He read John 11, 41, 42. And again, Christians, I need you to listen to this because I'm going to show you <clears throat> that in the context, Jesus claims specific titles that according to Islam belong to Allah alone. I want you to remember this category. Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. Tawheed, the Arabic term that was coined to denote the oneness of Allah. Al-Asma wa Sifat. Al-Asma means names. Sifat means characteristics. According to Islamic theology, hammered out by Muslims, specifically Salafis, there are specific characteristics and titles that cannot be attributed to a creature and belong only to Allah. It's ironic they quote this chapter because, as David said, we don't believe Jesus is the Father. We believe he's the Son of the Father. But at the same time, because Jesus is one with the Father in essence, he can only work in union with the Father. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And Christians, you need to know this. I, I don't, I, I, I'm not surprised Muslims don't get it, but there are even Christians that don't get this. According to biblical teaching, and the reason why we formulated the doctrine of the Trinity is because the Bible explicitly teaches Father, Son, Holy Spirit never work apart from one another. They cannot work independently. They can only work in perfect union with one another, which is why they're one God, because their being is one. They can't function apart from the other. They cannot act apart from the other, independently from the other. They can only work in perfect union. But because they're all God, they can all do things that only God can do. So let me repeat. Father, Son, and Spirit never act independently because they can't. Their nature is they're perfectly, inseparably united. And because they're all God, they do things that only God can do. And let me prove it from this very chapter and show you how Jesus just claimed the very names that Islamic theology says belongs to Allah, even though we don't believe all of the Quran is the God of the Bible. Here, let me read 43, 44. He read John 11. 41, 42. Let's read what happens right after that. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud, vo loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, come out. Because remember, this is Lazarus who's been dead four days. He's been dead four days in the grave. So Jesus summons him by his voice. This is going to be important in a minute. Notice a dead man who's been dead for four days. hears the voice of the Son of God. And he comes out and lives. Lazarus come forth. <clears throat> and he <clears throat> that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto him, unto them, I'm sorry, loose him and let him go. Now, this miracle of raising a dead man to life who's been dead for four days, whose body has been in the grave for four days, by the power of his voice was done to confirm what Jesus said earlier. Let me read earlier what Jesus said, same chapter, and why it's relevant, why it's relevant to proving that Jesus is God, even according to Islam. Jesus said unto her, the sister of Lazarus, who is weeping, I am the resurrection and the light. Muslims, I want you to hear this, because I have a question for you. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now in verse 27, what is the response? Notice what she did not say. Yes, I believe you are Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam and you are a messenger of Allah, Rasulullah. She said unto him, Yes, Lord, Rabb, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is to come into the world. So what did Jesus say? I'm going to do this physical miracle, raising a dead man who's been dead for four days by the sound of my voice to provide physical <clears throat> miraculous confirmation, I am the resurrection and the light. Now, you know why that's amazing? One of the names of Allah, and excuse me for butchering the Arabic, butchering the Arabic is al baith One of the names of Allah is al baith You know what that means? The, the resurrector. resurrector. <whistles> and here it is, Aisha Buley, a convert to Islam. Online, she has the list of the divine names 
the Nevi names, and here it says, Al Ba'ith, the Resurrector, the Razor. And she says, she translates it, the Razor, Resurrector, to recreate, like Al Mu'id, revive, also to send, the one who quickens mankind after death to cause something to be. Now, I can go into John 5, but I think we've established, and later on we can revisit John 5. I think we've established that the context shows two points. Jesus is not the Father. That's what Trinitarianism teaches. Jesus never acts independently from the Father, but always in perfect union with the Father. That's what Trinitarianism teaches. And secondly, Jesus does the things to prove that he is what even Islamic theology says only God can do and claim to be. He raises a dead man to life by the power of his voice to prove I am the resurrection and the life, all of which the Quran, Islamic theology, and Old Testament teaches can only be said of one who's truly God in the flesh. And this refutes the deity of Christ? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, not a good place to go. But notice, notice everyone, notice what Muslims do with their objections. Up, oh, Jesus talks to the Father. Uh, you see there, he's talking to the Father. Will presuppose that Christian will 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 pretend that Christians are Unitarians who don't also believe in the incarnation as well, and will will point out that if Jesus is talking to the Father, then obviously Jesus can't be God. We'll ignore the fact that this destroys Islam because of, because Allah is a father to no one, and therefore Jesus wouldn't be a Muslim. We'll ignore the fact. That if you understand doctrine of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Son enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth, he's not going to suddenly become an atheist. He's going to continue the relationship that he has had with the Father from all eternity. He would continue that through prayer. As Sam pointed out, they're going to do everything in perfect unity, in perfect harmony. And Jesus, to affirm his deity in this very passage, takes a title that, according to the Quran, only Allah has. Allah, no. Allah is the resurrector. Jesus says he's the resurrection and the life, right? Yeah. And he and, way, and, and, and the miracle is to confirm Sorry. his identity. My goodness, this is the passage you're going to show that Jesus is just a merely human prophet of Islam? Yeah. Okay. And by the way, just to show you, Muhammad Rahim, he's listening and showing his dishonesty. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. I want him to listen. I know. Muhammad Rahim, I hope you listen to this. Guys, hold his feet to the fire. I didn't say Jesus raising the dead proves he's God. Nope. So you're lying. Nope, here. straw man. What I said was... Jesus did a miracle to claim a name that even your theology says belongs to God alone, Al Ba'ith. He did the miracle to say, I am the resurrection. Moses never did a miracle to claim that he's God or to claim one of the names of God that even your theology says belongs to God alone. So stop the straw man, stop lying uh -huh. to your teeth. And here's my challenge to you, Muhammad Rahim. Show me a single place in the Bible and your Quran where someone does a miracle to prove that he possesses one of the unique names of your God. Stop your lies. That wasn't our argument, Muhammad mm -hmm. Rahim. Yeah, Muhammad, Ra Muhammad Rahim, do you, do you understand this, right? You've got Allah's 99 names. These are the names that can they can only in their they can only apply to Allah. Someone can speak the truth, but only Allah can be the truth. You know what I'm saying? And according to Islam, Allah is, is the only one that can hold the side. Historically, like Sufi Muslims who would walk out and claim, I am the truth, they'd be killed. They'd be yeah, killed for blas they'd be killed for blasphemy, right? And here you have Jesus taking these names upon himself left and right, taking names that according to Islam only Allah can have. Jesus is taking them for himself left and right and performing miracles to back up his claims. Is that something that a good Muslim prophet would be doing? Exactly. That sounds, I mean, if, if he was just a, a merely human prophet, he would have to be much like Allah and Muhammad, according to Muslims, the worst communicator in all of history. Because you know what people did in response to him? They kept worshiping him. They kept worshiping him in response to the things he was doing. In other words, they put it together. Wait a minute. He's making all these claims that only make sense from God, and yet he's performing all these miracles, so we believe in him. What do we do? We bow down and worship him. And and and, and that would have been a great time to say, guys, stop worshiping me. I'm 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 just I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to say that I'm just a merely human prophet of Islam, but I'm a horrible communicator, so let me straighten this up. But he doesn't. All right. So yeah. that's one. A uh, couple comments real quick. <laughs> I don't know why they keep talking. Johnny Two Shoes here. Wood's ignorance of Arabic. The phrase that Prophet uttered, cut my abhar, was a common Arabic idiom back then, used to denote death 
in any form, regardless of whether it was literally cut off okay. or not. Now, uh, one problem, one problem, Johnny Two Shoes, if it was as common as you're saying, then we should see it all over the place. Exactly. Right? Oh, we just beheaded this guy. His aorta's been his aorta's been cut. Oh, this guy fell down the stairs and died. His aorta's been cut. We should see this all over the place if that is this common thing. But uh, apart from that, dude, when we talk about this, we point this out, right? You got two possibilities here. E either Allah's referring specifically to the the severing of an aorta. And this is this is Surah 69 verses 44 to 46. Either Allah is referring specifically to the severing of a of an aorta. He means it literally. In which case, Muhammad dies later saying, and by the way, uh, I forgot, in, in case people are new to this, in the Quran, Allah says that if, if Muhammad were to invent a false revelation, if he, were, if he were to lie, if he were a liar, Allah would sever his aorta. Anyway, later, Muhammad dies after being poisoned by a Jewish woman whose entire family had been slaughtered by Muslims, right? So in the nutshell, Muhammad's followers slaughter this woman's entire family. And then she walks in and says, Muhammad, I've prepared dinner for you. Would you like to eat it? And Muhammad's response is, duh, yeah, I love dinner, <laughs> duh, right? So so, so, oh, so Muhammad starts oh, eating this food prepared by a woman whose entire family had just been slaughtered by Muhammad's followers. Of course, she had poisoned it, as any person who is not a complete imbecile would have uh, anticipated. She had poisoned it. Uh, one of Muhammad's followers drops dead from the poison. Then Muhammad suddenly gets his revelation. Up, oh, I, I think I got the up. Oh, 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 the the great God Allah is informing me that this thing is uh is poison. Of course, Muhammad had already uh, consumed some of it, but he spit it out. Uh, he spit the rest out. His his follower dies, and then Muhammad, Muhammad, uh, spent the next three years with problems. Right? It it was some sort of caustic substance that did internal damage to him. They said because they said they could see the impact of it in his mouth. So it had somehow corroded his the palate of, of, of his mouth. So this did some internal damage. Anyway, Muhammad spends a few years in complete agony, got to the point where uh, they had to, he had two of his followers had to carry him between them um, like, like Weekend at Bernie's. And so they're walking around hmm. with Muhammad in between them like Weekend at Bernie's. Uh, Aisha right. said she had never seen anyone in more pain than Muhammad was, right? And Aisha had seen a lot of pain in her life, especially with all the Muslim men beating their wives until their skin turns green. This girl had seen a lot of pain in her life. She'd seen a lot of pain. She said it, it was nothing compared to what Muhammad went through. So Muhammad was in horrible, horrible agony, and he dies saying that he feels his aorta being severed. Now, two possibilities. Either this uh, Allah is being specific here, He's going to sever Muhammad's aorta, and he means that specifically. And then Muhammad says it. And then Muhammad says, oh, it's happening. Other possibility is he's just saying Muhammad's going to die. Well, that happened too. If you're saying it's Muhammad's going to, if you're saying, hey, Muhammad's just going to die. Muhammad's going to die if he delivers a false revelation. Well, Muhammad delivered all kinds of false revelations, and, and then he died. So, so notice him. Notice how ridiculous this is. It just refers to death. So, 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 Maha, so Allah's great prophecy in the Quran is, if Muhammad invents a false revelation... He will die. Okay, he died. <laughs> so, so great. Thank you for proving our point, Johnny Two Shoes. And uh, and guys, keep in mind, we weren't we weren't we we weren't gonna we, we were we're talking about objections to the deity of Christ. We we mention that. Why? Why do we mention what happened to Muhammad? Because another Muslim wants to say, you know, my my. Allah can't get to me, so he went after my kids instead. And so we bring up all this stuff, and then. Notice, Sam, it's always Muhammad's followers who are getting us to start blasting at Muhammad, no matter what we're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. We come on here and right. we say, hey, we're going to play a bunch of clips of Adnan Rashid criticizing Christianity. We're going to talk about them. And Muslims will go, no, we want you to slam Muhammad. Please slam Muhammad for us. Man, with followers like this. <laughs> Dude, yeah, I mean, you must really hate Muhammad. You must be undercover <laughs> Christians pretending to Muslims because you're exposing Muhammad to public shame and... And, and scorn. So yeah. keep it up, guys. Yeah. Which one? We, we want to talk about Jesus. You keep bringing Muhammad. Keep yeah, it up. man, with fo with followers like, you know, it's funny. Yeah, they're they're yeah. not going to be able to stop. We're going to keep talking about Jesus. They're going to keep bringing Muhammad up and we're going to keep wrecking him and bring it up more and more and more. Wow. Um, and our, that too, you see the demonic influence because yeah. Satan doesn't want us to glorify Jesus so people don't get saved. But Jesus Christ is Lord, and people will get saved by the power of the blood of the cross. In Jesus' name, come on now. Hey Sam, you had your, uh, your you have your buddy Muhammad uh, Muhammad Rahim. Yeah. So he uh, he responded in the uh, in the chat. As Muslims, we do not believe that everything in the Bible is false. 
there's a lot it's of mission. there's a lot of truth in it, but also a lot of false. And by the way, David, that's an admission. Guys, he just admit that what Jesus said in John does prove that Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh, but he now attacks the authenticity of that statement. Good job. At least now you're admitting Jesus claimed to be God by claiming the very unique name of Allah, according to Islam theology, but you don't believe Jesus said it, so John lied and made it up. But that means you're admitting that if it is historical, it is genuine, and the historical Jesus said it, then he claimed to be the God of Muhammad, not a follower of Allah like Muhammad. Now, Good Sam, day. now, Sam, well, what would happen if they could actually put together what we've been discussing over the last several programs? What have we been talking about? We've been pointing out over and over again that the Quran affirms not just the initial inspiration, it affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the continuing authority of the Torah and the gospel. We also responded to Adnan's attacks against the crucifixion and resurrection stories. And what do we find? We know from the gospel that Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. Now we're talking about Jesus' divine nature and even the passages Muslims are going to, the very passages that they go to. You see here, this refutes the deity of Christ. Once you understand it in light of Christian in theology it makes perfect sense and it proves his deity instead of refuting it and it refutes islam it doesn't refute christianity and so so muslims have to say oh yes there, there's some truth in the bible but uh that, there's that falsehood but wait a minute uh, don't forget allah affirms the inspiration and preservation and authority of our scriptures he affirms the scriptures that we have he tells us to judge by our scriptures put all of this together muslims your god tells us to judge by our scriptures. Our scriptures say that Jesus is the divine son of God who died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. What's that mean? It means we have to judge your religion false. According to your own God, we have to say that your religion is false. That's the same God who says that, hey, if Muhammad invents a false revelation, then I'm going to sever his aorta. And Muhammad dies, my aorta, my aorta. I feel my aorta being severed. Oh, I'm dying like a dog. Come on. <laughs> they, they're making right, they're making me do it they're making me do it all right we're ready right, we ready to go on to the next one um by the grace of god Jesus. Uh, by the way everyone i've said it before i'll say it again now um as we go through various points um if you ever see a point that you want to use on your own channel in other words right. if you if you know a muslim who you who would dare use john 11 as a problem for the deity of Christ and you just want that you're welcome to download yes. this whole live stream cut out the part you want use that put it on your own channel and again if you you can make an entire channel out of stuff like this you can make a channel out of res individual responses to Muslim objections and things like that just by taking clips from uh, from live stream so we're not stingy with our material everyone's welcome to it all right you ready go ahead brother well, all right Jesus by you're, the power of the Holy Spirit we'll be ready Come you're, on. you're about to be stumped but this next That's one it, I, man. Take I, shahada, baby. I, I don't even know what the next one is but I know you're gonna be stumped that's it shahada baby I'm just kidding ladies and gentlemen as everyone knows you'd rather smack a bear in the mouth than yeah. mess with Sam Shamoon oh I don't know about that but yeah I would rather smack a bear in the oh. mouth than become a father Look. of Muhammad <laughs> all right we have to hang okay. on we have to do it Muhammad Rahim another one he can't stop yeah. he just can't stop getting us to wreck his own book his own God his own prophet we say guys we're gonna talk about your objections to the deity of Christ Sam don't they love us don't they love attacking the deity of Christ shouldn't they be loving yeah. us right now they should yeah, be but it's Satan. this should be it's the upset, this man. should be the dream come true they're accepting and responding to objections to the deity of Christ our favorite thing to attack but they just can't stop. Yeah. They can't stop. Yeah. So Muhammad Rahim says, we do not believe the four gospels to be the Injil revealed by Allah. Don't put yeah. words in my mouth. I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm putting words in Allah's mouth by telling you what Allah said. That's Allah right. affirms the scriptures that we have. He tells us to judge by the gospel that we have. Your prophet refers to the gospel that we have, right? That's what he said. He says, Jews, Jews have the Torah and Christians have the gospel. He commands Christians to judge by the gospel. Now, from in the first century, you had the four gospels. From the second century on, they were treated as a unit called the fourfold gospel. 
It was singular. If you were talking about a text, it was the fourfold right. gospel. You could refer to the gospel message. You could say that Jesus brought the gospel as a message. But if you're referring to a book, it referred to the fourfold gospel. So if that's what Christians have in the second century, the third century, the fourth century, the fifth century, the sixth century, the seventh century, and that's what they have. It's like it's like the the the, the Jews they have their Torah. The Christians they have their gospel, the fourfold gospel. Muslims have the Quran. If your God tells Christians to judge by the gospel, and he's talking about it as a book, a book that they have in their possession, if he means something other than what they, than the word they have, the gospel, the, their fourfold gospel, if he means something other than that, then he needs to tell them because they don't have anything else. They don't have some other, they don't have some other gospel. If he's saying that the Christians have the gospel and the Christians are reading the gospel and the Christians find Muhammad mentioned in the gospel and Christians have to judge by the gospel and Christians have no ground to stand upon unless they stand upon the gospel. If he says those things and he means, oh yeah, and I'm talking about a book you've never heard of and don't have access to, then your God is stupid and the worst communicator in all of history. <laughs> is that what you're telling us? Is, are you telling us that your God is a complete moron? I, I don't believe that. I think these passages are clear in the Quran. I think it's clear what your God is saying. You're the ones telling me that when Allah walks up to, walks up to Christians and says, you Christians, judged by the gospel yeah that book that you have and we go oh you mean this the fourfold gospel and yeah that that book the book that you have i can't make it any more clear can i judge by that you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand by that 14 centuries later his followers come along no he's talking about some other book that you didn't have guys i've said it before this would be like me coming to you muslims and saying muslims judge by the gospel right judge by the torah judge by the gospel judge by the quran and when i say torah i mean torah when i mean gospel i mean gospel but when i say quran i mean some other book that you don't have I would be the absolute worst communicator in history if I know that you Muslims have a book that you call the Quran and I tell you to judge by the Quran and that's the book that you have and I really mean something else. I would be a moron. I would be an idiot for talking to you like that. That's what you're telling me about your God. You guys are, you guys are some of the most blasphemous people in the world. Not just about Jesus, about your own God and your own prophet. What is this religion? It's nonstop, endless blasphemy claiming to be honoring God and honoring Jesus. This is hilarious stuff, Sam. You ready to go on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they want to keep subjugating Allah and Muhammad to ridicule and scorn, yeah, I'm ready to go and talk about Jesus Christ, the God of Muhammad. You know, it's funny. I got, I got, I got all, I got, I got all kinds of, I got all kinds of energy right now. I don't know why. I slept three hours last night. That's why I was up all early and read that comment and and, and uh, talked to you. Anyway, I thought I'd be falling asleep by now, but uh, nope, I'm I'm good to go. Yeah, because Muslims do that to you. They put you on fire by, by the Holy Spirit using their attacks to just get you on fire and passionate for the glory of Jesus. So, hey, Muslims, <laughs> keep it up. The more you attack and the more you say these things, the more you put us on fire by the power of the Holy Spirit to wreck Islam and magnify Jesus, now, the Son of God. Sam, I, which I just have to point out again, right? I just I have you to point out. Again? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm <laughs> deliberately not looking right now so that we can actually uh, get to some objections. But think about this, Sam. If, if, you, if you were a Muslim, and you were thinking rationally, and some Christians said, all right, we're taking all objections to the deity of Christ and we're going to discuss them. Wouldn't you carefully, thoughtfully, just keep posting objections yes, to the deity of Christ? Against the deity of Christ. Would you keep inviting them? Please destroy my book. Please destroy my prophet. Please destroy my God. Please. <laughs> No, no. Unless you're being paid off, pretending to be a Muslim to help the Christian cause. But obviously he's a real Muslim, and yet he does understand he's subjugating his God and prophet to ridicule, scorn, and shame. Keep it up, friend. Keep it up. Ursa Solar said, hey, David, you inspired me to make my own apologetics video. Thank you. Yes, we want, uh, we want tons of apologetics okay. videos. But everyone, keep in mind, the first step in apologetics is studying. Studying, right? Study, learn from people who came before, uh, learn the material, and then put it out. Make it your own yes. and put it out there. All right, here we yes. go, Sam. Yes. So I said this one's going to wreck you. What? Yeah, I'm about to oh, wow. out of bro. I'm now, scared. You're scaring me. Now, dude, we, we, went, we went to John 11, 41 to 42, and we pointed out that you actually read the passage. It proves the opposite of what Muslims wa the Muslims want it to mean. Yes. The, the passage only makes sense in light of the doctrine of the deity of Christ of his distinction from the Father and his incarnation. That's the only way you can understand the passage. And here we have, next, Matthew 11, 25 to 26. We, we, the same exact problem. If you're going to these verses and you actually read the passage, it proves the exact opposite of what you're trying to prove. Does it not? Yeah. It does, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, I'm shocked. As you can see from my reaction, folks, 
I am stunned and shocked. Oh, that... hang on. We don't have your reaction up there. Let me go back to the camera so they can oh, see yeah, your yeah. reaction. Oh, then it's there, yeah. So everyone, yeah, can, so, so everyone can see yeah. how shocked you are. Yeah. Uh, whoops. Hang yeah. on. All right. Yeah. We're back to you, yeah. Sam. Show us your shock no, reaction. No, I was just, I was like this. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I really. So one person was wondering earlier, hey, Sam, all right? He looks, honestly, guys, yes. when I talk about Islam and I hear their objections, it really drains me emotionally, mentally, because the nature of their arguments is so pathetically bad. But you know what? We have to keep enduring by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the energy the Spirit uh, <clears throat> supplies us with, because Jesus is worthy that we subject ourselves to such torture, because it is mental torture to hear Muslims cite passages that they don't realize actually proves the opposite and proves Muhammad is a false prophet. And, so but, here's and, Matthew. But, yeah, but, but, by the way, I mean, the, the, the cool part about this, even though it's tedious to, to see the sorts of things they use, my goodness, what an awesome opportunity to show people what Jesus actually said, especially for the Muslims here who think he's just claiming to be a prophet. What an awesome passage to go to. Thank you, Muslims, who use this as an objection. Yes. So, guys, let's look at Matthew 11, 25, 26. And as David said, the assumption is, since Jesus speaks to the Father and addresses the Father, Jesus can't be God assuming that the Father alone is God. So here it is, Matthew 11, 25, 26, but conveniently they didn't include verse 27, but we'll get there. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now I want you guys to pay attention. The Father is the Lord of heaven and earth. Pay attention to that, because I'm going to show you how it backfires against the Muslims in a minute. Because you have hid these things. What things? The revelation of who God is. God has hid the revelation of himself, not because he wants to be hidden, but as judgment for those who refuse to accept the revelation he's already given them. And side note, because we don't want to simply quote passages, but we want you to understand them. What Jesus is saying is, if God has given you revelation, and you keep spurning that revelation, rejecting it, then one of the signs of judgment and punishment is that God will then hand you over to the desires of your heart, hardening your heart and further blinding you, because that's what you want. God doesn't take someone who wants to know the truth and causes them to become unbelievers. God's desire is for all creatures, including Muslims, to be saved. But if you persist, and this is a warning to the Muslims, if you persist to reject the clear revelation of Christ and persist to twist it, distort it, misinterpret it, or, or mock it, then the danger can be that God then hands you over to your unbelief. And this is what the Lord is saying about the Jewish scholars, the Jewish scribes who had received revelation but refused to accept the revelation in Jesus Christ. So he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you hid these things from the wise and the prudent, those considered wise and prudent in this age, and has revealed it unto babes. And what Jesus means here, not little babies, but those who are considered mentally, emotionally, spiritually immature. Like David. You don't get more immature emotionally, mentally than David. That's but true. thank God, thank God, God is pleased to reveal that revelation to people like David, misfits like David and me. So he says, but you were pleased to reveal it unto babes. Before I move on, well, let me read 26. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Now, before I move on to 27 to show you how this refutes Islam, Let's repeat like a broken record. We are not Unitarians because the true God is not a Unitarian deity. We are not Unitarians because the Bible, the true word of God, doesn't present God as unipersonal, as a single person. We are Trinitarians because the true God has revealed in his true word that he is tri-personal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So to cite passages where Jesus is speaking to the Father, hallelujah! That's what a Trinitarian expects, especially now that Jesus is on earth as a man, and as the perfect man, he perfectly submits and worships the Father, as perfect human beings are supposed to do. Now, here's the nightmare, though. 27. For some reason, David, they didn't mention 27, mm -hmm. and let's see why. I mean, I mean, they, they shouldn't have mentioned 25 and 26, because here again, it's the son talking the to the father. But yes. wow, yeah, verse 27. Sam, isn't verse 27, like if you're making a list of passages that, that, that yes. clearly refer to the divine sonship of Jesus, isn't this the first place you Absolutely. go? Absolutely. One of the most powerful testimonies 
to the essential equality of the Father and Son, because both of them are God, in the Synoptic Gospels. Mm -hmm. Because usually they say, no, no, no. It's only in John where Jesus claims to be the divine Son of God, one with the Father in essence. And, no, and, 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 you'll and, find it in the Synoptics. And Sam, by the way, don't they call this the Johannine Thunderbolt? Because yes. it sounds exactly like something you'd find in the Gospel in of John. John. Yeah. That's exactly what it's called, Johannine Thunderbolt, because it seems like this passage should have been in John, not Matthew, and also Luke quotes it. And further point, because this came up, further point. <clears throat> now, according to the majority of New Testament scholars, you'll find material in Matthew and Luke that is common to both that's not found in Mark. Okay, now guys, listen to this, because this is a nightmare for Islam. If this is true, now it's a theory, and it's a theory that actually comports perfectly with inspiration. Because I want Christians to understand that our view of inspiration doesn't preclude human authors carefully investigating matters and sources and being guided by the Spirit to include those material that the Spirit wants to be included and material that's accurate. Okay, because now, because this saying, Matthew eleven twenty seven, is found in Luke ten twenty two, scholars believe that this is a saying that Matthew and Luke took from a common source that's older than Matthew and Luke, and that source is called Q, Quella, the German word for source, which is believed to be a sayings gospel of Jesus. Now let me explain that again, because I don't want Christians to get confused, and this is something Christians need to know. If you're in apologetics, you're going to need to learn this, because I had to learn it, and I didn't learn it from seminary, never been to seminary. Okay, you'll find Matthew and Luke containing the same material not found in Mark. So one of the theories that scholars have come up with is, that must mean that Matthew and Luke were using a source, and this source is exclusively a source that only contains the sayings of Jesus, and they gave it the word Q or Quella. Now, you know why that's important? Because if it's true, this comes from this sayings gospel, then this sayings gospel is older than Matthew and Luke, because they both used it independently of each other. Well, folks, let's now bring out the implication of that. If Matthew's written in the, in the 60s, and I believe maybe earlier, and Luke is written in the 60s, even Bart Ehrman would assign the date of 65 to 75 AD. That's within 30, 40 years of Jesus' resurrection. But Q would be older. Q would be older. In fact, according to the late F.F. Bruce, oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Hold on. According to the late F.F. Bruce, Q may have been as early as the 50s, Folks, you understand what that means? If Q, it was written in the 50s, that's written within 20 years of Jesus' resurrection, where all of Jesus' disciples are still living, preaching. Thousands of eyewitnesses, both friendly and hostile, are still living, which means that this sayings gospel must be historically authentic and goes back to the historical Jesus. You can't get around it. That means this is a saying of the historical Jesus. Now, yeah, well, here's Sam, where Sam, Sam, I just, I just, I just wanted to add something real quick, because there are all kinds of different ways uh, to look at this. Uh, so here we have Christians. If you believe in the inspiration of Scripture, well, guess what? This passage is as good as gold. It's right there. Um, if you're looking at it from a historical perspective and uh, a source critical perspective where you're going to the sources and 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 not just simply not just ex simply ex uh, uh, accepting them but rooting around for the most trustworthy material well this comes out as among the most trustworthy material we have yes if you're looking at it from an islamic perspective well your god affirms the gospel that we have and the gospel that we have is the fourfold gospel and so it's good as gold that way point is no matter how you look at that, this passage right here that our Muslim friends are telling us to go to for a refutation of the deity of Christ passes every standard that we can apply to you it. Know, any, way, any which way we look at it, it's as good as gold. Now, Sam, what does it say? Now, this cannot be denied. It's the saying of the historical Jesus. And we believe all, all the sayings of Jesus are. But even skeptical scholars would say yes. This is most likely a saying of historical Jesus. Now notice what the historical Jesus said, Muslims. He destroyed Islam. He said this, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Real quickly. Earlier, Jesus said, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now notice what he just said. Father is the Lord of heaven and earth, and all things have been entrusted to me. Contextually, Jesus is saying that everything that the Father is Lord over 
is mine. He's given it to me as his son and divine heir. That means the heaven and earth belongs to the son. This is further confirmed in Matthew 28, 18, where after the resurrection, Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Bam, Muslims, Jesus says he owns creation. That means he owns you and your prophet. And you better come to realize he owns you and the father owns you. And who, which father? The father of Jesus. So that's number one. But then it gets so shockingly good. No one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son and to whom the son chooses to reveal him. Wow, this is gold. And I'm going to have David to re reiterate the point I'm about to make. Okay, now, folks, notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, I'm a kind of person that only the Father can fully understand and comprehend. Notice what he says. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. Implication, Jesus is an incomprehensible being requiring someone with omniscience to know him truly. Since the Father is omniscient and knows everything, only the Father can know the Son truly. This would be blasphemy if Jesus is a creature. But then it gets even worse for the Muslims, and it's gold for Christian ears. Then he says, let me repeat it again, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. Notice what he's saying. It's reciprocal. The Father knows me to the same extent I know him. I know the Father to the same extent that the Father knows me. Now, if Jesus is a creature, this is utter blasphemy. No creature can know the Father to the same degree that the Father knows him because the Father is omniscient and knows you inside and out and knows what you're going to say before you say it. But Jesus says, I know the Father to that same degree. I know him the same way he knows me, which is why you need me to reveal the Father to you. So the Father and the Son are two incomprehensible, omniscient persons showing the Son is divine, equal to the Father, in essence, in glory, in knowledge, in majesty. And yet he's not the Father. David, help me out here. All right. Uh, I just want to take a look at this passage and and go ahead and kind of finish out the, the chapter here in, yeah, in Matthew, Matthew 11. But think about this. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Our Muslim friends, they tell us, aha, we've got you. Go to Matthew 11, and man, you're going to see some problems for the deity of Christ there. Because we're going to assume that you're Unitarians. And we're going to presuppose that you don't believe in the Incarnation. And then, as long as you grant those things, which no Christian would ever grant, ha-ha, we've got you. And please, by the way, please, 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 our Christian friends, please just ignore the fact that the verse completely destroys, destroys Islam by referring to God as Father and making Jesus the Son. But let's go ahead and read it. We're just going to read it all the way through, and then you'll see uh, everything Sam was pointing out. We'll go all the way to the end because, guys, it's pretty cool that Muslims sent us here because Jesus has some words for Muslims here. All right. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Notice, all things, all things. Is Muhammad a thing? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus owns your prophet, Muslims. Your prophet is the personal private possession of Jesus, according to this passage that you guys went to. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Father, who Muslims are acknowledging is, is God here in this passage. No one knows the Father except the Son. The Son is the only one who knows the Father. So Muhammad doesn't know him. No other prophet knows him. Jesus is the unique person who knows him. No one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. You can only know the Father by going through the Son, but that's what Muslims say we must never do. And that's Muslim, and that, Muslims, is why you can't know the Father. You can't know the Father without going to Jesus and accepting Him as the Son. But look what Jesus says here at the end. If you're struggling with this, if, you, if you're feeling burdened right now, ladies and gentlemen, at the, the, the weight of all of this information on top of you. Look what Jesus says. Muslims, if you're feeling weary and heavy laden and burdened because of all this nonsense that Islam has heaped upon you all your life, 
forcing you to adopt these completely ridiculous positions that make no sense if you're sick and tired of this. Jesus continues, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus declares his deity and then invites you to come. This is the passage that Muslims wanted us to go to, Sam. Muslims said go here. Yep. And by the way, uh, highlight Jesus' invitation only mm -hmm. makes sense. You said it, but mm -hmm. let's highlight it. For Jesus to be able to give everyone who comes to him rest means he must be omniscient. Why? Because he must know who it is that's seeking him for rest. He must be omnipresent because he must be able to be with you, to sustain you and give you rest. And he must be omnipotent. He must have that ability to give rest to anyone, no matter how numerous, that come to him. So what more do you want from the historical Jesus than what you find here where he claims to be omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, the Son of God who's incomprehensible, one with the Father, and the only one qualified to make the Father known to mankind by the power of the Holy Spirit. What else do you want? Um, yeah, so guys, notice, and, and here again, think of the reverse situation. If Jesus was just a Muslim prophet, you think he'd be saying any of this? You think he'd be saying that everything has been handed over to him by the Father, that no one can know the Father except through the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him? You think you think a mere human prophet would be glorifying himself in this way? I don't. So once again, yeah. if Jesus there is just saying that he's a Muslim prophet, worst communicator ever, and that's why Muslims, all your claims, oh, we respect Jesus, we honor Jesus, it's all nonsense to anyone who looks at what you say. Your entire religion is, is one nonstop insult to Jesus Christ. It's one nonstop blasphemy against Jesus Christ. And everything you guys say, claiming to honor him, you're insulting him. So give it up. A um, couple comments real quick here, Sam. Uh, Renatus, <laughs> Renatus here. He posts a funny comment. He says, Jesus, peace be upon him. So he's, 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 uh, he's, he's basically summarizing the Muslim claim. He says, Jesus, peace be upon him, was just a prophet of Allah who was born of a virgin, for we don't know why, who received the Injil, but and spoke of we don't know what, and was the Messiah, but what that means, I have no idea. <laughs> right? This is what <laughs> Islam is claiming, right? <laughs> percent on the money. Renatus, I'm going to uh, word that a bit differently and steal it for one of my videos. Sam, do I constantly steal stuff from other people for my videos? Friend, you've been stealing my material since the day I met you and you made it popular and you exploded because of it and I'm still panhandling, sinner. I am but when it comes to material, I am like I'm like Robin Hood. I am the yeah. Robin Hood of apologetics. I go just rob everyone and then and then give it out. Yeah, I'm going to give to the poor. I'm poor. Give me some, bro. Some breadcrumbs, sinner. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and and we have a comment here um, from Etesham Gulam. Yeah. Now, now, once again, ladies and really gentlemen, him? I don't know if this is the Etesham Gulam because I thought his account, I, I saw it on vocabs. I thought, he was, I thought his account was like answering Christians one or something like that. So I don't know if this is another account he has with his actual name on it or if this is someone different maybe he can uh maybe he can explain i would i would look at his comment and think this is too dumb for anyone serious to put forward but this is what shabir ali says so even smart muslims will will say this even though it's completely ridiculous but etashem says q doesn't have so he's talking about the q source that sam was referring to which again um you know we look at the sources matthew mark luke john acts romans and so on uh, scholars break them down into what they regard as independent sources. What's the separate material here? What are the separate sources? And they've got Mark, who, uh, who acts as a source for Matthew and Luke. So both Matthew and Luke include material that, that Mark uses. So the, the independent sources are Mark, Q, because Q contains material that's not in Mark, but is also used by Matthew and Luke. So Q, there's Mark, Q, there's what's called M. M is just the material that's no. unique in Matthew that doesn't occur anywhere else. Then there's L, which is the material that's in Luke that doesn't occur anywhere else. There's John, and then you have Paul and, and so on. So, yes. so they, that's how they break it down. Anyway, here's what's hilarious. When we talk about Q, we don't actually have a copy of Q. It's just the yeah. say it's just the sayings, the sayings, the quotes from Jesus in 
Matthew and Luke that are not found in Mark. And what you have here is Etesham Gulam, if that's a real hymn or just an imposter, says Q doesn't have Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Now, why this is hilarious, <laughs> it's a sayings document. It's a collection of quotations. If you ask scholars what Q is, they don't have a copy of Q, but they say it's a collection of quotations. It's a, say it's a collection of sayings. And, and, and notice the, the, the Muslim objection, ha ha, but it doesn't contain the crucifixion. It's a collection of sayings. If I, if I say, hey, I have a collection of sayings from George Washington, ah, oh, but it doesn't talk about him dying. Right, it's a collection yeah. of sayings. Are are you dumb? What what are you saying? Right? Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm, and I'm saying I'm saying this because you would think that only like the dumbest person in the world would use this, but Shabir Ali is incredibly intelligent, and he still says this. But Q doesn't 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 talk about Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Right? It's a, it's a collection of sayings that he, it's a collection of things that he said. Oh my goodness. Anyway. And by, let me quickly though. Now guys, understand the stupidity of this objection. And if this guy is the Muslim apologist, we think this is why he should retire. Mm -hmm. Notice, though, Matthew and Luke do contain the story of Jesus's crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection. That means they found no problem mm -hmm. if Q did exist, found no problem incorporating Q into their <clears throat> gospel accounts because there's nothing in the sayings of Jesus in this Q document, if it existed, that denies that Jesus would be killed, buried, and be raised on the third day. But now notice how he threw out this red herring. We're talking about how Q, if it did exist, shows the historical Jesus claiming to be God in the flesh, one with the Father. What does he do? He ignores that and how it destroys Muhammad, and he runs to the crucifixion. Nice one. Mm -hmm. Smoke and mirrors. Um... Uh <laughs> Here we have Malik ZQ, Act 17 Apologetics. It's a good thing a lot of Christians have outed you as a fraud, David. How long do you think you can continue to obfuscate Hadith and the Quran until people realize? Any idea what this dude's talking about? This guy is upset uh, that you schooled him the other day when we took his <laughs> questions, remember? And so now he's just resorting to ad hominem because he's got no objections. But there is a sincere Muslim in the comment section, folks, and I want you to be a little gentle with him. Muhammad Ibn Jadis is here. He mm -hmm. was in my s session, my my live stream, mm -hmm. and I told him, don't change subjects, listen, and he was respectful enough. He didn't interject, he didn't attack, he listened, and even w at the end he said, this makes more sense than what I was taught. So the man is open. Muhammad Ibn Jadis is not like Etisham Gulam, or this other gentleman, Malik ZQ. He is willing to listen, mm -hmm. and he's open. So pray for him, and don't harass him or treat him like the others who are simply here to hit and run. Do a hit and run. Yep, guys, but Christians have outed me. Hey, hey, Malik ZQ, why don't you... Every, every time we ask, every time we ask, give us specific, right? Because, Sam, remember the other day? Uh, was that was that yesterday? He said David Wood is a liar, and I would say tell tell me what tell me what I'm lying about. Give me give me the example of what I'm lying yeah. about. And he said my prophet Muhammad. <laughs> right. I'm lying about the prophet Muhammad. Right? We're asking what we're actually lying about. They love to toss that around. Liar, 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 liar. And we say what are we lying about? Show us, and then we'll go to the sources and we'll see if we're lying or not. Okay. Well, you're a liar, right? And so it's uh it's awesome stuff. What a religion, man. What a religion. Malik ZQ is posting this over and over again. I'm looking for any follow-ups to see if he was actually given details. But no, uh, we'll he's see. Just, he's upset. All he's right. Upset. Shameless. Are we ready to go on to the next one? You're surprising me and rocking me. I'm about to take Shahada, man. Can't be keep doing this to me. All right. Guys, now we have another one. This one's going to shake Sam Shamoon to his core. That's it. I'm uh, retiring. I retire, man. All right, Sam. So we went through 11:41 to 42. Yes. We went through Matthew 11:25 to 26. Both those passages, John 11, Matthew 11. If you actually read the passage, it turns out that it only makes sense in light of the Trinity and the incarnation of the Son. But now we've got one where you're not going to get away from, and that is right, Matthew well. 27 verse 46. So I'm going to read uh -oh. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. I'm going to go ahead and read the verse, and then you are going to take your Shahada. That's it. All right. So here you have it. Here you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew chapter 
27, verse 46, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus was God, it would make no sense for him to say, my God, my God, talking to someone else, and then say that this other God had forsaken him. It would yeah. make no sense. And so here again, shameless Sham Shamoon just won't repent, even that's though he's it. clearly been refuted. Jesus says right here, plain as day, that he's got another God. Sam, that's how it, how Over. can you how can you continue being a Christian knowing yeah. that Jesus had that's a God? It, you, got you got me. By the way, Mark fifteen thirty four, because I saw it on the list. It's the same thing. Do you want to read that so we can knock out both of them together? Okay, let me go ahead and quote. It's the uh, same one. It's yeah. the same one because I'm about to take Shadow right after you. Right after he cites Mark 15, 34, I take Shadow, folks. Okay. So, Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is so devastating in its refutation of the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ that he went through it twice. That's it. I'm over now. Double the my... double the verses, double the refutation. All right. Now, do you, do you want me to take it in Arabic or English? Should I do it in English so people can understand? Yeah, do it. Do it in both okay. so that everyone knows that Sam Shimon okay. has converted based on this decisive refutation. Ashadu la ilaha illa Yahweh, and Ashadu Yesu ibn Allah, Habib Allah, Shafi Allah, Huwa Allah, Al Masih Akbar. I bear witness there is no God but Jehovah, and I bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God, the Beloved of God, and He is God, the Messiah is greater. That's my shahada. Okay, now, <laughs> obviously. Okay, let's, let's begin. Number one, and you've heard David say this, you've heard me say this, and I did an entire session, by the way. I did an entire session on Good Friday on this passage, Matthew 27, 46, bringing out its deeper implication. Jesus is crying out the words of Psalm 22. Jesus is crying out the words of Psalm 22, and there's a reason why he's crying out. Now, I can't go super in-depth, but if you go to my YouTube channel, Shamunian, look for the Good Friday message. I believe it was on Good Friday. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I think it was on su Sunday. I believe it was on Sunday. One of those days, Sunday, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, I unpacked this. We went into the meat of it. Now, Jesus, our Lord, is quoting Psalm 22, the opening verse of Psalm 22. Now, let me read it and explain to you why it's significant. Because even Christians must understand what it's saying. Psalm 22, verse 1, here goes. <clears throat> to the chief musician upon Ijelith Shahar. I don't know what those words mean. A Psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But now let's finish the second part. Why are you so far from helping me? and from the words of my roaring. If you actually read the context, when Jesus cries out the opening verse of Psalm 22, he's not saying so much why God has abandoned me. Actually, the context of that statement, don't take my word for it, folks. Read the Psalm. It's basically saying, how much more longer will you abandon me to my fate, to my judgment, until you come to my deliverance? Let me repeat. What Jesus is actually saying is, all right, Father, I have now drunk the cup. God's wrath has been appeased. How much more longer will I remain in this condition until you come to my deliverance? It's basically saying, okay, it's finished. The judgment's over. Time for me to come home. Now, to prove that's what he means. If you read Matthew 27, 45, and if you read Mark 15, 33, You'll see it says there was darkness. This is what the text says. Matthew 27, 45, Mark 15, 33. It says there was darkness from noon to 3 p.m., from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. And then Matthew and Mark explain why the darkness dissipated at the ninth hour. Do you know why? Because Jesus prayed. When he prayed, the darkness was removed as a sign God had answered him. So number one, it's not Jesus saying, you've abandoned me. It's basically saying, it is finished. Salvation has been accomplished. I have drunk 
of the cup of God's wrath. I've appeased God's holiness. Time now for me to come home. It's an ends. It's over. Salvation has been accomplished. And the Father's answer is, yes, it is done. It is finished. It is over. And the darkness was removed. So that's the first point. Second point. Why is Jesus calling out to the Father, my God, my God? Why is he calling him my God if he's God? Because as David and I, and as church history has been saying for 2,000 years, Jesus isn't simply God, he's also man. He's the eternal son, the eternal word, that became a genuine human being, taking on a genuine human nature, a physical body that he received from his blessed mother, his mother Mary, while she was a virgin, no man touching her, by the power of the Holy Spirit. As man, Jesus is man as God intends man to be. And David said it earlier, and I'm going to repeat it. The perfect man in atheistic world, because we're not atheists. God is real, and he created the world. So he wants human beings to acknowledge him and to love him and trust him and worship him perfectly. Jesus becomes the perfect man to do what all human beings are expected to do. Trust in God, love God, and worship him perfectly. In this case, the Father, because Jesus is not going to worship himself. But he can worship the Father and trust in the Father and have communion with the Father if he's the perfect man sent by the Father to serve the Father and accomplish his will. This is basic Christian theology. And to prove my point that Jesus calls the Father his God because he's also human, let me read the Psalm, Psalm 22.10, and then David can <clears throat> recapsulate everything I said. Psalm 22.10, pay attention, same Psalm. When did the Father become Jesus' God? Because this psalm is about the Messiah. Psalm 22.10. Notice, folks. I was cast upon you from the womb. You are my God from my mother's belly. Wait. David, help me understand this. The psalmist, who's actually Jesus speaking through the mouth of David, says that you are my God from my mother's belly. In other words, from the moment of my human conception. From the moment my blessed mother conceived my human nature, you've been my God. Now, David, isn't that what we'd expect if Jesus, who's not just God but becomes man, that from the moment of his human conception, his father would be his God too? Mm -hmm. So why are we shocked that the God-man, the perfect man who's perfect God, cries out to his father and acknowledges that because I'm also man, you're also my God from the moment I became human. And when did he become human? We don't believe like the liberals believe. You are human at conception. That's why it says, you've been my God from my mother's birth. And to prove it's a, this is about Jesus, let me read just Psalm twenty two sixteen. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Psalm 22, verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now again, for the sake of time, I'll stop there. But I hope you guys understood my point. There's nothing in what Jesus said that refutes the Trinity. Far from it. So, uh... uh... Re recap there. This is not Jesus randomly crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's actually quoting scripture. Uh, even if he were simply crying out these words, it would make sense in light of Christian theology of yes. the Trinity and the Son entering creation and taking on a true human nature. But Sam, Jesus doesn't randomly cry out. He quotes the opening verse of Psalm 22, which is about this, which is about the sufferings and ultimate vindication of the of the suffering Amen. servant of the suffering servant. Sam, would Jesus Jewish listeners, the people who are listening to him, know that he's quoting a he's he's quoting a psalm to them? Absolutely, because they didn't have chapter divisions. So how would they identify Psalm? By the opening words. And David, real quickly, mm -hmm. let me just read 23, 24 of that chapter. Psalm 22, 23, 24, that it's a prayer to come to my deliverance. And that's exactly what happened. Here it is. Psalm 22, 23, 24. Notice what the psalmist, who is Jesus speaking through the mouth of David, says. Here you go, guys. So you know I'm not making it up. You that fear the Lord, Jehovah, praise him. All you seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you seed of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, meaning Jesus. Neither did he hide his face from him. But when he cried, he heard him. There you go. Mm -hmm. He heard him. So Jesus 
yells out a verse that certainly the Jewish leaders would have known by heart, inside and out. They know that entire passage. But every all these people who grew up in the synagogues, they know he's quoting this psalm. And this psalm is about this suffering person who is ultimately vindicated by God. And Jesus says, hey guys, that's me. Well, wow. all right, guys. Um, so guys, uh, not sure where you're getting a denial of the deity of Christ. I mean, may maybe if that's all you had to go on and you never knew Jesus said anything else, then you might think this is, you know, just a just a guy, you know, crying out in pain or something like that. But when you take into account everything Jesus says and you factor it in here, the, guys, this all ties together. This all ties together. This is what Jesus is 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 here for. Um, now, I have a I have a comment here. This guy keeps posting stuff attacking the uh, Gospels. I, he has a he has an Arab name, but I mean, he sounds like an atheist with some of his points. He's saying, "Go to Matt Dillahunty. Go to Matt Dillahunty." So I'm guessing he's an he's an atheist. No, you know what I think it is? Hmm. It's a Muslim trying to use an atheist against you because you debated him. You know their tactics. It's like quoting. Well, I mean, the, the points he's making are some of the dumbest points ever. So I, I mean, look. So notice all the current copies of the Bibles you have you guys have are corrupt. So notice yeah. if this is a Muslim, then he's he's just proven our yeah, point yeah. that Allah doesn't know what he's talking about because Allah affirms our scriptures. Um, and two, what in the world do you mean by corrupt? What do you mean by corrupt? Textual variance, what do you mean? Because if you if, if by that you mean corruption of fundamental doctrine, no one says that. No one believes that. Uh, the transmission by the scribed have screwed up. And where are the original copies of the Bible? There are no originals. Now think about how stupid this is, Sam, because I mean, there's no way to say it. You know, I, I try to be nice, but this is just really, really stupid to say this. You don't have the originals. So the originals would have been written on papyrus. Yeah, yeah. Papyrus, if you're using it, right, if you're passing around and reading it, lasts about 10 years before it falls apart. So he's actually saying, hey, the originals written in the first century would have been written on a substance that lasts about 10 years and has to be, that's why it has to keep being re recopied, right? So where are the originals that would have fallen apart after 10 years, huh? How come you don't have them 2,000 years later? Checkmate, morons. That's what, <laughs> that's what he's saying. It's like the dumbest thing anyone could have. It's like, it's like saying, uh, you know, why don't you have, why don't you have uh, uh, Jesus' sweat that was on his head, huh? Why don't you have that? Uh, that sort of thing wouldn't, wouldn't have lasted, you know what I mean? Um, it, it, papyrus doesn't last. The only, the only, papyrus can last in certain circumstances. If you keep it perfectly dry and don't touch it, in a in a very arid area, you can you, it can actually survive a long time. But if you're actually using it, if you're using it for church services and stuff like that, it doesn't last. It falls apart after about ten years. So you're asking why something that lasts ten years is not around two thousand years later? Do, do you do you re and you think you're being smart? You think you're schooling people? Yeah. And by the way, what happened to the Quranic manuscripts compiled by Muhammad's companions? Yeah. Well, we we have them, unless you don't lie. Exactly. And it was a Muslim who then destroyed them, right? To a shame. Okay. Just burn them all. Burn them all. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to know. Just wanted again, uh, uh, again, I mean, the measures, yeah. I mean, the, the, the way this guy's uh, just blasting away at, at, I mean, the way this guy's arguments would flip back, the way his claims would flip back on Islam instantly and cause us to conclude that the Quran has been corrupt. I'm still wondering if he, if he is actually like an Arab atheist or something like that, but uh, we'll see. Cause he actually, he's acting like one. All right. Should we go on? I think there's only one more verse, Sam. There's only one, and then we can open up the floor to any challengers. All right. So here we go. Here we go back. Did this one, this one's silly too, uh, by the way. No, it's not. It's a decisive refutation of everything you believe. You're going to make me take shahad again. Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 46. Sam Shamoon about to recite the shahada yet again. In the presence of everyone. Here we go. Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So, Sam, once again, That's the it. Quran says that Allah is a father to no one. It makes no sense for a Muslim prophet to refer to God as Father. Jesus, the son, is referring to God as his father. Yep. And so, uh, 
what do we have here? Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So once again, I think we have to approach this as Unitarians. We have to yeah. assume and we have to ignore the Trinity and the Incarnation. Approach this as Unitarians. If Jesus is talking to the Father, then that must mean that the Father is God. And if the Father is God, Jesus obviously can't be God because then he'd just be talking to himself. Wow, your theology has been wrecked once again. I'm done. I am done, bro. I am so done. I'm not going to show my face ever again because I never knew this passage existed. Stick a fork in you. You're done. That's it. I'm done. Yeah. Not. Okay, folks. You know, it's ironic, as David just highlighted. Not only is God the father of Jesus, which means Muhammad is a false prophet, but this proves that Jesus died on the cross, which Muslims deny isn't it ironic that the passages, the last two passages, Luke 23 and Matthew, which was paralleled in Mark, are all tied in with Jesus being beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, hanging on the cross, and then expiring and dying, all of which Muslims deny. So now, even if they wanted me to end up rejecting the sonship of Christ, if I believe those passages, I have to believe Jesus did die, he was killed on the cross for my sins, and that he was raised on a third day, which means we still end up with Muhammad as a false prophet and antichrist, a son of Satan. But folks, let's repeat this again. And then if David wants to then talk about it or just open up the floor to a Q&A. Folks, we have no problem as Trinitarians that Jesus, the God-man, and he's still the God-man in heaven because he was raised in his physical body, now glorified, immortalized. The God-man praying to the Father, because prayer is not simply worship, it's communication. Communion. What do you want Jesus to do? Stop talking to the Father? Father, now that I'm on earth, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I mean, come on, be serious. But because we're Trinitarian and we believe there are three different persons, not one person playing different modes, they can, quote-unquote, pray to one another, speak to one another, have communion with one another. And then later on, we'll show why this is more problematic for the Muslims and their God praying. But I want to focus here. Now, is it ironic that you're going to quote the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus, the God-man, speaks to the Father, and upon death, surrenders his spirit to the Father, and he's the one who commands himself to die. In other words, even there, it shows that Jesus was in control of when he died, because he gave up his spirit and died. It wasn't taken away from him. But here's what's even more ironic. Luke, who wrote Luke, also wrote Acts. So Luke wants you to read Luke and Acts together because it's not one writing, it's two writings that Luke gave us in order to show us the history of Jesus and the church, how the risen Jesus then poured out his spirit upon his disciples and then converted Saul, who is Paul, and used them mightily to spread his kingdom on earth and create the church. Now, why am I appealing to Acts? Because guys, Christians, I want you to pay attention. Jesus prayed to the Father, and yet we're going to find Jewish Christians, Jewish believers in Jesus, in Jerusalem, praying to Jesus the way Jesus prayed to the Father, praying to Jesus the way Old Testament saints prayed to Yahweh, to Jehovah. What do I mean? Acts 7, 59 to 60. Pay attention, folks. Stephen, who's a Jew, filled with the Holy Spirit, mighty in the Old Testament, the first martyr of Christ, the first one killed for Jesus. And where? In Jerusalem. And now notice what he says. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, that's Jesus, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Two points. Stephen, at the point of death, cries out to Jesus to take his spirit in glory and then asks Jesus to not condemn his murderers for their crime. Stephen is praying to Jesus the way Jesus prayed to the Father and the way Old Testament saints pray to Jehovah, because in Psalm 31, verse 5, Psalm 31, verse 5, notice what the psalmist says. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Jehovah, God of truth. So we have Stephen, 
praying to Jesus the way Jesus prayed to the Father when Jesus was on earth, the way Old Testament saints pray to Jehovah, and we have Stephen entrusting his spirit to Jesus and asking Jesus to forgive his murderers, but Jesus is in heaven. How can Jesus in heaven do what Jehovah does in heaven, namely receive the dead at the moment they die and forgive sins of people on earth while he's in heaven if Jesus is a creature and not God in the flesh, the Son of the Father? And this is from the same writer, Luke, David? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So what was that about Luke 23, 46? Yeah, not gonna help. Not gonna help. Uh, not gonna help Islam here. None of this does. All right, guys. Well, we went through all of the verses that uh, someone in the comment section said that his Muslim friends are using to refute the deity of Christ. Didn't find any of them uh, persuasive. Uh, pretty much, pretty much all of them refuted Islam. Right? Like, it, pretty much all of them. If you just read the verses where, where Jesus was yeah. referring to the Father, and therefore would falsify Islam and mean that he's not a Muslim prophet. So uh, even even if even if you didn't, even if you didn't try to understand them, they at least refute Islam. When you actually look into what Jesus is saying, all of this fits together into Christian theology. Now look at what we have here in response to all of this, Sam. You ready for this? I'm going to take Shahada again. I don't think you're going to take Shahada after this one. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Acts 17 apologetics. Why does God even need son? It's like doing sex with my googly eye creation and having a baby with genetics of human and plastic. I don't think that's God's description. Now, Sam, you want to look at this and say, how how can how can Christians explain Christian theology to you? To make it clear that we're not talking about God having sex and producing an offspring that has nothing to do with this here. Yeah. The, the the relationship between the father and son is an eternal relationship. It's from Spiritual. all eternity, right? Just like just like Muslims believe that Allah's speech is eternal. So there's Allah, and simultaneously his speech is co-eternal with him, right? So you have two, yeah. you have these two eternals right here. Well, the, the relationship between Allah and his speech is an eternal relationship, according to Orthodox Islam. Well, the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit is an eternal relationship. Why, in the name of common sense, do you think we're talking about having sex and producing an offspring? Do you know why? It's because your God and your prophet were so dumb that they didn't know what we were talking exactly. about. And they say these kinds of things. What? How can God have, how can God have a son when he has no wife? Durr! Right? Now think about this. Think of, that's the Quran, ladies and gentlemen. Now think about this, right? Because because we've covered this before. In the gospel, which the Quran affirms as the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, the Father affirms Jesus as the divine Son. The Holy Spirit affirms Jesus as the Son. Jesus affirms himself as the Son. The angel Gabriel affirms Jesus as the Son. John the Baptist, a prophet, affirms Jesus as the Son. His apostles affirm him as the son men affirm him as the son women affirm him as the son jews affirm him as the son gentiles affirm him as the son even the demons affirm him as the son everyone yeah. we could possibly go to yeah. uh, in, in, on any level of reality here affirms jesus as the son yeah. the son of the father Centuries later, an illiterate 7th century caravan robber comes along and says, What? He's a son? That doesn't make any sense. God didn't have a wife. Durr. <laughs> if, if, oh, Muhammad, yeah. if Muhammad had had an ounce of common sense, it should have he should have said, Wait a minute. Let me figure out what these people are talking about. And they would have said, We're not talking about God having sex and producing an offspring, you giant, giant moron. But but with Muhammad, nope. That's the only thing a father can be. That's the only thing. That's the that's the only father son relationship that could possibly be. We're talking about we're talking about human reproduction. And Sam, by the way, you've pointed this out many times before. Yeah. For for yeah. For, for for Muhammad to think, for Muhammad and Allah to think that if you're talking about a father son relationship, the only thing this could possibly be referring to is sexual reproduction, as our Muslim friend just said here. 
Can you think of a problem that they've got in the Quran if that's the oh, only no. if that's the only way to understand this language, this filial oh, these man. filial language? Man, you just made my day. Did Folks, I? Oh yeah, because now we're gonna have fun because Allah got a girlfriend. Does he? He's got his his thing going on, you know what I'm saying? He does. Nobody, oh yeah. <laughs> Folks, guess what? Chapter 43, verses 3 and 4 of the Quran. Chapter 43, verses 3 and 4. It says the Quran has a mommy. It says this is an Arabic Quran. It is in the mother of the book. Guys, the word is Um al Kitab. Mother of the book that is with us. The mother of the book that is with us. And then if you go to chapter 13, 39, it says Allah can blot out anything in the mother of the book that is with him, with us. Oh, mother Quran has a mommy. Mommy. Quran has a mommy. Mommy. And the mommy belongs to Allah. It's with Allah. But the Quran is supposed to be the word of Allah. That means the Quran's daddy is Allah and its mommy is Allah's wife. So Allah's getting his thing on with the mommy to produce the Quran. Allah Akbar, David. Yeah. Now, 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 guys, do you understand what, what we're talking about here? The Quran refers, it, it's not always in the translation. Sometimes it'll say the source of the book or something like that. But in Arabic, it says mother of the book. So there's Allah, there's his, there's the Quran, and there's the mother, the mother of the book. Now, every Muslim will want to say, that's not talking about a, a, Allah having sex with the mother and producing the Quran as an offspring. I would agree, but your God and your prophet are the ones who, like you here, say and insist that if you're saying that there's there's father and son from all eternity, you must be talking about sex. You're the one saying that if you're talking about this father-son relationship, this parent and offspring relationship, that it can only be a biological sense and not some not some other sense of father and son. You're the one saying that. Well, if you're the one saying that, and then you talk about the mother of the book, and the mother's with Allah, and you've got Allah, the mother, and then the Quran, the offspring, well, great. Then you're talking about your God having sex with a book and producing the Quran as an offspring, right? You can't get around it because the only way you can get around it is to say, okay, we're not talking about, we're not talking about that. Okay, great. Then you would have to say that your God is wrong for insisting that that's the only thing we could mean. There's no way out of it. There's no way out of it. Yep. So thank you. <laughs> thank you yes. once again. <laughs> I keep someone saying it. Someone said to you, someone said to you, surprise, David. Surprise, surprise. All right, so notice, Sam, we weren't we weren't going to talk about that. <laughs> they keep doing it. They keep doing it to Are themselves. Are we paying you guys? Guys, <laughs> let everyone know we're not paying you to pretend to be Muslims to help us destroy Islam. We're not paying you, man. All right, here, here, here you go, Sam. You have uh, you have Ali, uh, Ali Hassan here says... Uh, all Abrahamic religions believe in unity, Tawheed, and all of a sudden there is Trinity that is full of logical fallacies. If you can prove it, I will convert. Uh, there are so many mistakes in this little thing. Uh, Sam, if you go back, if you go back to early Judaism, yes, did they believe in what Muslims believe about Tawheed? Absolutely not. In fact, the standard work that's used by scholars, and it's written in a way you can even understand it very simply, is by the late Jewish, and he was Jewish, mm -hmm. he wasn't a Christian, Alan F. Siegel, Two Powers in Heaven. He documents from Jewish writings before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, and even admits this was a belief held by many Jews up until at least the second century. The Jews knew from the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, there was, uh, there was at least a second divine power along with Yahweh, Yehovah, sometimes called the angel of Jehovah, sometimes the son of man. Now, to give you actual documentation of this, the book of Enoch, the book of Enoch mentions the son of man, which is the motif of Daniel. It's taken from Daniel 7, 13, 14. And in the book of Enoch, folks, don't take my word for it. You got liberal critical scholars that Bart Ehrman. Oh, yeah. Uh, I forgot about him. In his book, How Jesus Became God, he has a section, folks, he has a section where he's parroting the arguments of Siegel and others, where he shows that in the Judaism before the time of Christ, and he quotes these sources, they believed in a pre-existent divine Messiah, and he quotes Enoch. I even quote him in one of my articles, where he says that according to Enoch, 
the Son of Man, who is said to be the Messiah and said to be the elect one, the chosen one, exists before creation. And he's hidden with God and then will appear in the latter days and he'll sit on a throne of glory and all the kings of the earth will have to worship him. This is a Jewish source, folks. And this is a commentary on the Son of Man found in Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Another Jewish source for Ezra. And this is something acknowledged by a liberal scholar named John J. Collins. I know because I quote him in these articles and in my sessions that I do. And he says that for Ezra, there you have a divine pre-existent Messiah who will appear in the latter days who actually dies but will be resurrected for Ezra. This is not a Christian document. And then we can go into the Dead Sea Scrolls and look at what's known as 11Q Melchizedek Scroll. A scroll found in Cave 11 of the Qumran community where Melchizedek is depicted as the God of Psalm 82 where texts about Jehovah are applied to him and he's said to be the God in the heavenly council who on behalf of Jehovah destroys the other gods, <clears throat> Melki Rasha, I believe, the Belial, the evil spirit being and his, and his <clears throat> angels, destroys them and makes atonement for the people of God. These are all Jewish sources. I didn't even quote the Old Testament. I don't, I don't need these sources. I can go to the Old Testament and show you the Trinity in the Old Testament, right? But I'm giving you sources written by Jews who are not influenced by the New Testament. There was no New Testament. Who just reading their Old Testament could see there's more than one divine person in heaven. I hope that answered the question. I don't know. You want me to further elaborate? I will. Um, now we have uh, Behold a Son here says, Why isn't there a single chapter in either the Old or New Testament that explains the Trinity in detail? Why do we need this mental gymnastics for something that should be so clear? What well, are you... Uh, what, what, yeah, go ahead. David, I'm going to say, okay, it's clear to me, it's clear to you, it's clear to millions of people, it's been clear to millions of Christians throughout the centuries that the Old and New Testament, what they do say about the Godhead, is so clear and explicit. In fact, the church was forced because of the clarity of Scripture to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity because they knew no other doctrine right, would fit what the Bible teaches as a whole concerning the Godhead. Mm -hmm. So when you say, why isn't it clear? Clear to who? It's clear yeah. to us, maybe not to you, yeah. but that can be turned against them. But go ahead, David. That yeah, can well, be turned against them. Why is it not clear to people who never study it? And <laughs> Why is it not clear to people who never read it and don't care about it and only want to attack it, right? That, that that that's that's the main that's the main argument, right? Why is it why is it not clear? I've never studied it, but why why is it not clear to me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's begging the, that's yeah. like I said, that's assuming. To you it's not clear because you don't want to see it, even the way you ask the question. Mm -hmm. But someone who just comes to scripture, guys, here, and you too be old the son, I challenge you, I dare you, have the courage to do this. Pray and say, God, if you're real, and I believe you are, I want I want to now come to the Bible without any presuppositions without any traditions that tell me what you can and cannot be. I'll accept you as you are. I, I make a promise to you, God. If you can show me who you are in the Bible, if you're a trinity and Jesus is the God-man, I'll accept it. I won't put any limitations on what you can and cannot be, and I guarantee you, you'll be worshiping the trinity with us in a matter of time. If you ask sincerely and honestly, because Jesus says, Jehovah says, you will seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. No conditions. All your heart. Open. And that's just to the Muslims. Open. Mm -hmm. Honest. God, whoever you are, I won't put you in a box. I won't tell you what you can and cannot be. I'll accept you as you are. Please make yourself known. And I promise you, mm -hmm. the Trinity will reveal himself to you. The triune God of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you'll be worshiping the Trinity with us. And Sam, think think about the think about the irony here. I mean, it, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. I mean, if you're talking about really knowing God, understanding God, that that's a that's a serious subject, right? I mean, even even on the level of creation, right? Imagine saying, "I want to understand uh, quantum mechanics," right? That's just a creation. That's something created, exactly. right? You, imagine saying, without ever reading a, without ever be, being, you know, without ever taking a, a physics class or anything like that, saying, "Well." I mean, 
if if quantum mechanics is right, why well, why why does it sound so complicated? You can't just say it in one little you know one little line that makes it easy to understand, huh? Why it's got to be so? Dude, David, I want to give you some good news. Though. Some 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 topics are, some topics. Uh, yeah, I'm just I just wanted to point yeah, out, sure. guys. Yeah. Some topics are some topics take time to to get your minds around, and and even you know something again. You're talking about quantum mechanics or Einstein's theory of relativity or, attempt, or particle yeah. physics, things like that. You have to spend years of your life, many decades of your life, to really grasp these things, and that's the level of creation. And you got people coming up. Well, I mean, why can't God be in this neat little box that I can just, you know, oh, bam, it's right there. Oh, I got it. Well, that if, guys, if anyone comes up to you with a God and says, here, I got this super easy to understand God, that's an idol. That is an idol. Reject that paganism. Go ahead. David, I want to give you good news, guys. Pray for Muhammad Ibn Jars. Uh, look what he just said. He goes, I am fighting my faith. He's getting rocked. That's cool. <clears throat> guys, pray for Muhammad Ibn Jarzi. I think it's, yeah, no, no, Jonas, it is Jonas. He's being rocked. The Spirit is touching him. Keep praying for him. Mm -hmm. I am fighting my faith. His faith is being destroyed by the true God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. He just posted that. And uh, Muhammad, we're going to, uh, our plan, Lord willing, is to be here again tomorrow night. Um, yes. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take some more comments, and especially uh, if Muhammad here has anything he'd like us to cover uh, again tonight. But um, in case anyone, in case anyone has to leave at any point, we are planning on being live tomorrow. And the, and the topic is, Sam's going to address the common Muslim objection. What about the different Bibles? Some of them have sixty-six books. Some of them have seventy-three books. So we're actually going to look at that yep. and uh, and deal with that objection. Um, yep. And speaking of books, here we have Ali Hassan here. I don't care what your book says. I don't believe in yours, and you don't believe in mine. That irrational for an argument. And yes, it is one faith that God is one by all means. Uh, Ali, I, I don't know how you can be watching these and still not get the point. You say you don't believe in our book. You don't believe in our book and we don't believe in your book. Well, you're right about us not believing in your book because your book is completely false according to our book. But your God says he believes in our book and your prophet says he believes in our book. Your God and your prophet repeatedly say they are affirming the scriptures that we have, right? Your God says, Jews, I believe in your book. Christians, I believe in your book. Your, pro <laughs> your prophet even said he told the Jews to bring him a copy of the Torah. And he said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. This is Muhammad saying to a copy of the Torah that the, that the Jews had in their possession, I believe in you. And here you are. I don't care what your book says. I don't believe in it. Can, can, can you get your mind? How can you not get your mind around this? Your prophet says, your book, I believe in it. You look at the same book. I don't believe in it. I reject it. I don't care what it says. Your God and your prophet command us to judge by our book. Your God and your prophets say we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon our scriptures. You say, I don't care what your scriptures say. Your scriptures are a lie. I don't believe in them. You contradict your God and your prophet like it's an Olympic sport. You're an apostate according to your religion because you don't believe what Allah says and you don't believe what Muhammad says. The Quran, chapter 4, verse 65, says that if you have any resistance against anything Muhammad says, you're not a real Muslim. You're fake. You have all kinds of resistance exactly. against what your prophet says because your prophet affirms our book. Your prophet points to the book and says, I believe in you. You say, my prophet's stupid. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You're not a real Muslim according to your religion. How do you not get this? So, of course, we reject your book. Your book is the most obviously ridiculous forgery in the history of humanity. But your, your book affirms our book. So if you happen to take your book and your prophet seriously, you can't reject ours, but you do. Why? Because you don't really follow your book. You're not really a Muslim, dude. Muslim means submission. You're not submitting. Go ahead. Yeah. No, there, I think there's another Muslim who's being rocked, and I just want to confirm. I don't know if it's a Muslim or Christian. I think it's a Muslim. Lukman Wardur, Wardur, man, dude, Wardur Earl. You're horrible, dude. Lukman. Because it's Wardur Earl. It's W A R D E R D E R E L. Lukman Wardur Earl. Are you a Muslim? Because he says, don't know what to do. I'm doubting my faith. Sounds like a Muslim because the word Lukman is from the Quran, but there are Assyrians called Luqman. I know one, a Syrian Chaldean. Mm -hmm. And I just want to correct another misinformation. Mm -hmm. Someone here said that Nestorians don't believe Jesus is God. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You know lie. how I know? Do you know how I know? 
my ancestors, my parents are part of the Nestorian church. I'm, I'm part of the Assyrian church of the East. In the West, it's called the Nestorian church. And my parents, their parents, the church, it's still around, diehard Trinitarians that believe Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh. So that's a lie from hell. Hey, check this out, Sam. Yes. <laughs> Muhammad El Shahri says, be careful, friend Christians. This David Wood lied a lot about Islam. If you want to learn Islam, do not learn it from haters of Islam. Uh, haters of Islam like David Wood. No, have you noticed, Sam? I mean, how many times has this happened in the past two days? They say, David and Sam are liars, or David's a liar. And I said, uh, okay, what, what am I lying about? And they say, you're a liar. Well, yeah, what? What am I lying about? Our prophet. Well, yeah, what, 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 what am I saying that is a lie? What am I saying that is false? Because you can point out what, I, what I'm saying, and then, oops, if I'm wrong, then then I guess I'm exposed. And all they say is you're lying. And guys, yeah. when you keep saying I'm lying, but you can't say what I'm lying about, I think we start to get our minds around the idea that maybe you're just saying liar because you can't, you, you have yeah. no evidence, right? All right. Um, now, let me highlight an inconsistency though, David. He's telling you, if you want to learn Islam, not from you, but obviously go to Muslims. But then you have Muslim apologists like mm -hmm. the Dean Show and even recently Adnan to save face got a group of Muslim apologists from the UK and do nothing but attack the Bible, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, and teach Christians what the Bible says. So now you see the inconsistency and dishonesty. They don't want us to talk about the Quran, but they think they have the right to then talk about the Bible and its alleged corruption, its contradictions, and how the Bible denies the Trinity. So then why don't you condemn the Muslims saying, hey, you guys shouldn't be talking about Christianity and the Bible. That's dishonest. Let them go learn the Bible from people who believe it and let them go learn the Trinity from Trinitarians. See that? They won't tell their fellow um, Dawagandists. So, but that's how it is. That's how it works. Hey, here we have uh, Claudia here. Claudia Perfetti says, uh, Dear David, if you are truly serving God, the Father of Jesus, why are you insulting to people submitting questions? Uh, Claudia, I don't know if you notice, I'm uh, insulting towards people who are uh, saying certain things, right? Someone has a legitimate, well thought out question, then we, we answer the question, right? Like uh, Sam, Sam, Sam was interacting with uh, with Muhammad earlier, and you know we, we do that. If if you're if you're attacking and insulting and arrogant and saying really really stupid things that shows that you do not care about the answer, well, Sam. How, how did Jesus respond to people like that? Just read Matthew chapter 23, Luke 11. He called them brood of vipers, serpents, white watch, sepulchres, and all and on it goes. And, and so that's yeah. how Jesus t treated hypocrites, snots, who yeah. were not interested in hearing what Jesus had to say, but create obstacles so others wouldn't hear what Jesus had to say. He was very harsh with them. He wasn't yeah. very kind. So, uh, so yeah, there, there are basically a couple different kinds of people who, uh, who, who come to the chat and ask questions and so on. There are people who are looking for answers, and there are people who are trying to distract everyone else and trying to lead people astray. Uh, we can spot those people pretty easily, and we know how the Bible responds to them. So if we are... If we are sons of the Father as well. I don't see how you can avoid it. And if you have a problem with that, I don't know how you read the Bible. All right, uh, Sam, here we have a another from Muhammad al Shahri. He says, yeah. Jesus did pray to God. How a God pray to himself? Do not lie to yourself. A God pray to God? All right, Sam. Yeah, I knew this okay. was going to come okay, up. Okay, okay, okay. I say it was going to come up? Yeah, let, 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 let's, let, let's go off in a different direction because you've already explained yes. it nine different times. Yeah, We're Trinitarians. Okay. Father, Son, <laughs> Holy Spirit. The Son oh, enters like creation Jesus. as Jesus of Nazareth. Muhammad, do you expect the Son who enters creation to suddenly become an atheist? Or is he going to continue his communion that he's had from all eternity with his father, but now that he is taken on a human form, he will have to yeah. continue that communion through prayer. So, son, praying to the father in light of the doctrine of the Trinity and the incarnation, that all fits together. If you want to say the doctrine of the Trinity is false and the incarnation never happened, say that. But don't don't come to us and say, well, it just makes no sense for for." For Jesus, the divine son, to pray, because that would mean he's he's praying to himself. That shows you're not even listening to what anyone is saying. Okay? Yeah. But Sam, yes. if they had so given Christian theology, in other words, ladies and gentlemen, here's how you do it. You say, 
if Christian theology is true, if the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation, if those two doctrines are true, does it make sense for Jesus, the incarnate Son, to pray to the Father? Yes, that makes perfect sense. But yes. Sam, if they really have a problem, exactly. if they really, really have a problem with God praying, does this affect us or does it affect them? Man. And you know what's beautiful, David? Mm. Praise Jesus Christ. God is using you mightily because I'm listening to the responses. They know the answer. They're already mentioning it. Nice. And I just want to encourage Christians, the Lord Jesus bless you. You bless my heart. That's the purpose. We want you to learn the arguments and use them for the glory of God. And I see that everyone's saying it. Now, folks, here's, the, here's who has the problem. Allah is supposed to be a singular person. Even though they won't use the term person, but you get the point. And yet, the Quran says Allah prays along with angels and Muslims. Here's the proof. Guys, remember these three verses. Now, David has done <clears throat> videos on this. I've done sessions on this. He's done sessions on this. We did a session together. We got articles on this. So do find our articles on Allah praying because we give you the verses in the Arabic lexicon so they don't run away <clears throat> and deny what their sources teach. Three verses, remember, chapter 2, verse 157, chapter 2, verse 157, chapter 33, verse 43, 33, verse 43, and chapter 33, verse 56, chapter 33, verse 56. Now, here it is. Let me read it for you. These are they upon whom are the prayers of their Lord. You can also render it as prayers from their Lord. And the Arabic is salawatun, salawat, from their Lord and mercy, and they it is who are guided. Now, Christians, now the Muslims are going to deny it means prayer. But before you quote these verses, you ask the Muslim, say, can you tell me what salawat means? That's the plural for prayer in Arabic. Let them define it. They'll say prayers. Say, you sure, right? Okay. Then in chapter 33, verse 43, and chapter 33, verse 56, 33, 43, 3356. He it is, he it is who prays for you and his angels too to bring you forth out of the darkness into the light, for he is merciful to the believers. He it is who prays for you and his angels too. The word is you salli. Just remember the word salah. Remember salawat and salah. Then ask the Muslim, what does salah mean? They'll tell you pray, prayer. Now let me read the final verse. Verily, Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. Yusaluna, ala and nabi pray for the Prophet. You who believe, pray for him. Sallu, and salute him with a salutation. So notice the last verse. Allah joins a group. Allah and the angels form a group that perform this action. Allah and the angels are performing the same action. What action? They're performing the action of Salah. Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet, and that's why the Muslims should pray for him too. In other words, what Muhammad is saying is, look, Allah and the angels themselves pray for me. You should be praying for me too. So for the life of me, I can figure out how the triune God can pray. Jesus, who's not the Father, can pray. The Spirit can pray to the Father and the Son, meaning communicate and have fellowship. But if Allah is a singular per person, and he's joining angels, and he's praying with the angels. I know who the angels are praying to, according to the Quran. I know who Muslims are praying to when they pray for Muhammad, not to Muhammad. They're praying to Allah. Who in the world is Allah praying to when he prays for Muhammad, especially when he's doing so with the angels and believers? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, Muhammad al Shahri. <laughs> Your God prays, but he's supposedly a Unitarian God. Uh, so who's he praying to? Is he talking to himself? Uh, what'd you put here? How a God pray to himself? Yeah. I, I, or is a God praying to a God? Which one is it? But you just made fun of what your God says. You made fun of it. Because your Quran says, and, and the Hadith say, that your God prays. So you got to pray in God, and if you don't have a trinity to make sense of that, 
boy, you got some problems here. So uh, you just you refuted Islam. Muhammad, you are a, you are an apostate <laughs> as well. Every Muslim who talks to us turns out to be an apostate. Uh, yeah. This is some amazing stuff. Um, oh, you, you know what, Sam? You, you talked about people like they're they're learning over time. They're they're learning uh, re responses. Check out Lizzie Fenton here. This 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 goes back a little earlier, but she says Mary can have a son without a husband, but God can't have a son without a wife. Does everyone get that right? When when uh, when people say, uh, if you were to say Jesus is the Son of God, the response according to the Quran is, how can Allah have a son when He has no wife? It's impossible. Allah can't have a son without having a wife. What's 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 Allah saying there? You need a father and a mother together to produce a son that is the only possible way that you can have a son it's impossible any other way so according to Allah you can't have a son without also having a mother you need a you need a father and a mother now why is this relevant well Mary raises the exact same objection when the spirit appears to her and says you're going to have a son she says how can i have a son when no man has touched me and the spirit's response is it's easy for allah so wait a minute allah can't make up his mind mary says hey wait a minute don't you need father and mother to produce a son and allah says no what are you talking about are you stupid of course anything's <laughs> easy for allah Allah could just have a son right now pow like it's nothing he can make a son it's no problem but if you say jesus is the son of god it's what that's impossible it can't be you'd need a mother in order for god to have sex with her and produce an offspring yeah. what is what is this religion man they don't even they don't even they don't even see it but lindsay gets it here all right, Sam. I think we should. Uh, I think we should. Uh, well, just oh. one thing. Lukman is reaching out to you. Lukman will say he is a Muslim. He goes, Sam and David. I know this is silly, but is this thing about the seventy-two virgins real? If it is, I simply can't believe this is from God. And David, you like my comment on the Moom Squad comment section, by the way. So it's a guy who's following you. He's Muslim. He's rocked, and he's mm -hmm. like, man, if these seventy-two virgins are real, I cannot believe this is from God. Yeah. So, um, uh, Lukman here. He says. Uh, Sam and David, I know this is silly, but this is, uh, but is this thing about the 72 virgins real? If it is, I simply can't believe this is from God. David, you liked my comment on the Boom Squad comment section, uh, by the way. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, Lukman, you, you've got, you've got the, you've got the Quran and the Hadith, right? The Quran refers to the horis that you get in paradise. So faithful Muslims will be rewarded with these uh, horis and the Quran goes on to describe them the hadith flesh them out and the hadith are are fairly inconsistent on that they'll 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 describe things differently and give uh, different kinds of numbers same thing with the commentaries but Sam what do we at least what do we at least know from the Quran if you go to chapter 78 verses 31 and 33 which is very graphic you'll see that it says awaiting them are these maidens with white eyes and this is literally what the Arabic says. Kawa'ib atraba means swelling, firm breasts. I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to get graphic. That was kind of silly. I overanimated it. But you get the point. In other words, these maidens, their breasts are firm. They don't sag. And this is what awaits the Muslim. And, and then if you go to chapter 56 of the Quran, it says that these maidens haven't been, and literally the Arabic says, haven't been deflowered by any men or jinn. In other words, they're waiting for their husbands to come and deflower them. That's what the Quran says. So, hey, this is the Quran. It's graphic language. I'm, I, I even got embarrassed to repeat mm -hmm. it. But that's what it says. Yeah, well, you'd be embar even more embarrassed if you actually went through the hadith and the commentaries, because that's where you find out that, you know, the, the number 70 or 72, that's kind of the minimum. You can actually get way more. Um, you find out that, uh, I mean, according to some passages, again, these are going to these are going to differ in their uh, reliability. But um, you've got Muhammad saying that. Uh, that Allah will actually take the wives of the Jews and Christians and give them to Muslims 
in paradise. You have uh, the question being raised, how are we going to keep having all this sex? And Allah says that he's going to give you a miraculous erection, a penis that never goes soft. So you can just spend all eternity having sex. So this is going to come down to how you uh, assess the hadiths, how far you're willing to go. But at the very least, you have what the Quran says. Yes, according to Islam, um, you there are all these uh, you know virgins waiting for you in paradise and that is how muhammad that is one of the ways he enticed people to join his religion muslims think muhammad went around he was preaching and there were all these converts nonsense when muhammad was preaching uh mono just simple monotheism and convert to me because of the quran he won very few converts he was preaching in mecca for years and he had around 100 converts after years of preaching so that didn't work when he changed his method to if you join me then we will go out we will take people's stuff we will take their wives captive and you'll either come back in which case we'll split up all the war booty the women the slaves all of that stuff we'll split it all up or you'll die in battle and you'll go to heaven and you'll get even more win-win right that's oh, yeah. that's when he started getting massive numbers of followers so that is islam and uh my friend if you say you got a problem with that i got a problem with that too all right uh, by the way let me just give them the references i said chapter 56 it's 55 55 verse 56 write that down 55 56 just want them to see and uh, <clears throat> that there it says what i said 55 verse 56 i won't quote it forget about mm -hmm. it but 55 verse 56 all right, Sam. Uh, one more. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, check some super chats after one more comment from Muhammad Rahim. This is from earlier, yeah. but it's a good way to uh, um, um, to round out this section. Earlier, Muhammad Rahim said, "So why do we need to worship Jesus? Why don't we just worship the one true God, aka the Father?" Now, I think this is amazing because Muhammad Rahim just said that the Father. Yeah. is the true God, and he just renounced Islam and apostatized yet again, because yes. according to the Quran, Allah is a father to no one. If you say that you are that he is your father, uh, according to the Quran, the entire universe is about to shake to pieces because you've said that. And you yeah. just said it. You just said God is the father and that you want to worship. And so you've renounced Islam. You are no longer a Muslim. And so, Sam, why should he worship yeah. Jesus in addition to the father? Now, since you referred to Jesus' words where he calls the Father the only true God, that's found in John 17, 3. Because Jesus is the Father's Son, who's one with him in essence, and therefore deserving of the same worship, honor, and glory. And you know where I got that from? Jesus himself. In John 5, John 5, 22 to 23. John 5, verses 22 to 23. It's because he's the Father's Son, and because he's equal to the Father in essence, in glory, in nature, in power. He deserves the worship of every creature to the same extent that the Father does. And this is what our Lord says. Moreover, the Father judges no one. Guys, write down John 5, verses 22 to 23. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. And here's the reason. So that all may honor the Son just as, even as they honor the Father, he that honors not the Son does not honor the Father which sent him. Now, notice what Jesus did not say. The Father wants you to honor Jesus as a prophet messenger. That's not what he said. The Father wants you to honor Jesus as a great moral teacher or as your parents. He goes, no. The Father wants you to honor the Son just as you honor the Father. So if you worship the Father, he wants you to worship the Son. If you pray to the Father, he wants you to pray to the Son. If you're willing to give up everything, your family, your fortune, your life for the Father, you must love Jesus to that same extent because that's what the Father wants. And then in Hebrews 1, verse 6, notice what God the Father commands the angels to do. Hebrews 1, verse 6. And again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, first begotten into the world, he, God the Father, says, let all the angels of God worship him. Worship who? My firstborn, my son. There you go. What do you want? So, By the way, I want to just share this real quick. Uh -huh. Lion Bar made me laugh at this one. He goes, Allah joins the WhatsApp group chat. I like that. I had to say that. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. a good one. Go ahead. Um, wanted to check out. Uh, they're actually, they're actually, uh, why did Wahid get blocked? I don't know it was Wahid. Uh, yeah, Wahid. 
Well, yeah, well, he'd uh, asked the question. He said, uh, top U.S. apologist from Amir Stein, Omar Soleimani, is saying that the verse, to you be your religion and to me be mine, is a Medina verse. Is this true? No. Surah 109. No, no. Just, look, just, no, just, not. just, just type in, just type in chronology of the Quran or chronological Quran. They, they've got the list. Yeah, he's made um, off on that one. Yeah. So, uh, no, Wahid, that is Surah, Surah 109 is indisputably. You can look at the historical background. You can go to the commentaries, but just type in chronological Quran and go to any site that gives you the order of the surahs, and it breaks them down between. Meccan surahs and Medinan surahs, and that is indisputably uh, Meccan Meccan surah. And it wouldn't even, wouldn't even make any sense later. Anyway, they they said he was being abusive. Apparently, yeah, he was like swearing. Someone said he was like oh, okay. cussing. Okay, that makes sense then. Yeah, got to go. Um, all right, guys. Well, Sam, there are uh, there 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 are actually some uh, some really good questions in the super chat that okay, go ahead. we didn't look at. So, all right, let's go let's go through these. So, uh, Dwayne Burke says, "Allahu Akbar." <laughs> He's got he's got a picture of a bomb there. Yeah. Vince Sanity nine nine seven says, uh, "How do you show people Jesus is one with?" This is what I mean. You got good questions here. How do you yeah. show people Jesus is one with the Father in nature, not just purpose? Yeah, that that's easy to do. Mm -hmm. That's easy. So if you want me to take a minute to answer, that, I can, yep. because I I already saw this come up because someone quoted John seventeen twenty two to offset Jesus being one with the Father. Ma in ma essence, ma matter of, matter of fact, uh, since that. Uh, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and read the next question because that's related to it. Uh, question oh, in really? chat. Yeah, question in chat. Someone wants to know, in John 17, Jesus shares his glory with the disciples, but uh -huh. in the Old Testament, God doesn't share his glory with no. anyone. So the point is you have a, you have a couple of issues in yeah, yeah. John 17 here. Um, and then, of course, you have, uh, you have Jesus one with the Father. So you've got these questions uh, based on the Gospel of John. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, that the glory part. Let me answer the first one. One because again, I don't mind taking as much time as David you want because it's your your call. Because, mm -hmm. you know, because that other one with the glory. No, that's not what Jesus was saying. Mm -hmm. He wasn't giving them the glory that belongs only to God. It's a different context, a different point. But I'll get to that because that's mm -hmm. quoting John seventeen twenty two. Mm -hmm. But let me deal with how do I show that Jesus is claiming to be one with the Father in essence, not simply in agreement that he's one in agreement that you're they're united in their purpose. Let's go to John 10, 27 to 30. I got to unpack this now. So guys, bear with me. I'm going to try to be as fast as I can, but not too fast where you missed the point. John 10, 27 to 30. Ironically, I brought this up yesterday in my session on 1 John 5, 7. My sheep hear my voice. Pay attention to what our Lord says. My sheep, if you have a Bible that you underline or highlight, highlight, underline, my sheep hear my voice, underline my voice or highlight that, and I know them and they follow me. I give them everlasting life. Highlight that one. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand, deliver them out of my hand. Highlight that. My sheep, my voice, I give them everlasting life, no one can deliver them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no one is able to deliver out of my Father's hand, pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now here's what's interesting. You Greek readers will know this. The verb are is esmen. Esmen is plural. It's literally I and my Father, we are one, proving Jesus the Son is not the Father. We are. They're more than one person, but they're one in essence. Now, how do I know here Jesus saying I am one with the Father in essence? Because of his claim that no one can pluck believers out of my hand like no one can pluck believers out of my Father's hand. Why? Because we're one. One in what sense? In our ability, in our power, to preserve believers from ever perishing, from having anyone destroy them. That's how I know it's one in essence. Further proof, notice the language of Jesus. My sheep, my voice, in my hand, I give them everlasting life. The Jews knew their Old Testament, and they knew what Jesus was saying. Because let me read Psalm 95, let me read 6 to 8. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Jehovah, the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Did you catch it? Israelites are the sheep in Jehovah's hand under his care, and they are to hear his voice. Jesus, a Jew, standing in front of Jews, he says, they're my sheep, hear my voice in my hand. Who do you think you are? But then it gets worse. 
when I say worse, for the anti-Trinitarian. But for us, it's glorious. I give them everlasting life. None can deliver out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32.39. Deuteronomy 32.39. See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God with me. I kill, I make alive. Jesus not only makes alive, he gives never-ending life. I give them everlasting life. I wound and I heal. Neither is there anyone that can deliver out of my hand. Jesus, I'm really confused. The Old Testament, it's Jehovah that says, I give life, none can deliver out of my hand, and that we are his sheep, in his hand, hear his voice. But you just said, you give everlasting life. The sheep belong to you, they're in your hand. No one can deliver them out of your hand, and they're to hear your voice. That's why if you read 31, 33, it says, at this, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, and Jesus said, many good works I've shown you from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? They said, for a good work we do not, do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, a man, make yourself out to be God. They knew what he was claiming. That's how I know that the oneness here means oneness in essence in nature. Now, what, do you, what else do you want me to do now? You want me to answer uh, the other one? Yeah, what, what do you think about the, uh, the glory objection? Oh, that's, that's so easy. Okay, first of all, folks, let me read the context clearly. And again, I'm not, not, not trying to belabor it, and I'm not trying to go too fast. Let's read the context to see what it's saying. John 17, 22. This is another canard, another canard that anti-Trinitarians, especially Muslims, bring up. John 17, 22. And the glory which thou gave me, the glory which you gave me, Father, I've given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. See? If Jesus is God because he shares the Father's glory, so are the disciples. If you actually read the context... The glory that Jesus is giving them is different from the glory that he shares with the Father before the world was, a glory that only belongs to God. How do I know? In other words, there are two glories. Let me show you how I know. John 17, 5, And now, O Father, glorify me alongside of you with the glory I had with you before the world was. Okay. This glory that Jesus had before the world was is not the glory he's given to the disciples. How do I know? Because in John 17, 24, folks, pay attention. John 17, 24. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you gave me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Notice, this is the same glory he had with the Father before the world was, because he's talking about being loved by the Father before the world was. But now notice here in 24, they don't share that glory, they behold the glory. So they can see my glory. What glory? The glory I shared with you before the world, the glory that only belongs to God. They don't share in it, they're only going to see it. And when they see it, they're going to realize that I'm truly God in the flesh, one with you. So then what glory is Jesus talking about that he's given them? Guys, write this down for the sake of time. Write down John chapter 2, verse 11. John chapter 2, verse 11. John chapter 11, verses 1 of 4. John chapter 11, verses 1 of 4. John chapter 11, verse 39. And John 14, verses 13 to 14. John chapter 2, verse 11. John chapter 11, verses 1 of 4. John 11, verse 39. And John 14, verses 13 to 14. The glory that he's given them, this is confirmed in John 17, 18, where he says, As you sent me in the world, I too send them in the world. He's talking about the glory that he manifested on earth. What glory? All those passages will tell you that every time Jesus did a miracle, he was revealing his glory. It's the glory of ministry. The ministry that Jesus is going to send the disciples to do, where in his name, by his power, they're going to do miracles. And those miracles will manifest the glory of God being revealed through their agency. Don't take my word for it. Read those passages. When Jesus turned water into wine, there it says, the disciples saw the glory of Christ. Jesus then tells the disciples when Lazarus is dead, this is for your benefit that he died, because in it you will see God's glory and the Son of God will be glorified. So the glory that he gave them is the glory he manifested on earth. The ministry that he sends them to do where they'll do miracles, through which God will be glorified and his glory manifested. But the glory that he had with the Father before the world, a glory that reveals the Father and Son as God, that glory he didn't give to them, that glory they simply see. 
So in short, in, in the Old Testament, when we read that God will not share his glory with another, that is a particular kind of glory. That's not saying that n no one can have any kind of glory. You can obviously have all kinds of glory yes. in this world. That particular kind of glory he does not share. And so when Jesus refers to the glory that he had with the Father before the world was created, that's that divine glory that d is not shared with any mere creature but there is there are other kinds of glory that can be manifested in this yes. world and that's what that's talking about and so the only way this could be a criticism if 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 the only way this would be an objection is if someone went there and said there's only one kind of glory in the bible and anytime the word glory is used it must always refer to the glory that uh that jesus had with the father before you know the foundation of the world and that's just indefensible right, right. okay father Andrew, i want to bless you with this comment andrew martin who though claims to be an atheist, he really loves Jesus in his heart. Look what he says about us. Hmm. Muslims, can't you see? This is Andrew Martin. Muslims, can't you see? Can't you tell that God is with Sam and David? This is why you will never succeed. Mm -hmm. And this comes from Andrew Martin. Who so again is an atheist, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> That's awesome. Now, He's now, close. now, all we need is Hindu historian to say the same thing. That'd be. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, a couple more. Uh, let's go through some more uh, in the super chat. Chris Claus said, "God bless both of uh, both of you, men and your families." Arlen three says, "Jesus is the answer, whatever question you have." Amen. Cheryl, David, uh, let me bless you with this before you go on. Muhammad Ibn Jars, look what he said about us. You're going to be blessed. I am learning a lot from my searches online. I was told Sam and David was deceptive liars. I have not found this yet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Guys, pray for Muhammad Ibn Jars. He's on his way to worshiping Jesus. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, mm -hmm. brother. Go ahead. I just had to um, share that. Amen. Uh, Cheryl R. says, Thank you, gents, for being such ardent, awesome defenders of the faith. George Wagner says, <laughs> It's a quote from Allah. Allah says, I know what I mean, but not how to say it. <laughs> and, that's, and notice, ladies and gentlemen, that's what the Muslims are telling us, right? They keep telling us Allah just doesn't know how to say what he means. He's trying to say your Bible's been corrupt, but he, he keeps coming out. I affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the scriptures you have with you. Now judge by them. And so he just, he can't say what he means. Like he has some sort of cosmic Tourette syndrome. Um, Rapture Countdown says, uh, Muslims shave societal pressure to stay in Islam. There are definitely societal pressures to, to stay in Islam. Uh, Fadhili Washburn says, please do a video council like the Council of Nicaea. Um, <laughs> now we're, 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 we don't we don't have that kind of authority. I mean, we we are dealing with uh, we are dealing with the Assyrian Encyclopedia. Uh, we're dealing with the Assyrian Encyclopedia here. So if you want to uh, uh, if you want to go with Doctor, but you don't need the councils anymore. You, you, we, we, yeah. you know we, we kind of don't need that that kind of thing. Those those councils were were meant for sorting through uh, the the complete text of the Bible and trying to condense doctrines down to their to their absolute uh, to their absolute cores. And and so that's that's been done. Um, Sparky Master said, Jihadi Carp used Splash, but nothing happened. David Wood used Hyper Beam. It's a critical hit. Jihadi Carp fainted. Defeated hmm. Team Islam Grunt. God bless. I'm assuming that's some that's some video game lingo there, or I guess so. Yeah. Uh, Solitary Emmy with the uh, with the fox in the uh, super sticker. John Cass said, All right, here you go. John Cass said, Thanks, David and Sam. David, can you consider to make a video about apostasy? It will be helpful. A Muslim told me that converts to Islam who leave Islam are precious guests. I guess he just left Islam with that statement. Uh, yeah, uh, I've made numerous videos about apostasy in the past. In fact, the fir I think the first real video where I'm like sitting in front of the bookshelf that I ever made was a video about apostasy. It's called... Uh, Rifka Berry and something with apostasy because you know Rifka Berry was was uh, was was an apostate uh, back you know you're talking like a decade ago or something like that Rifka Berry was an apostate who was um, on the run so look up Rifka Berry and apostasy and you get one of those earlier videos but uh, yeah you I mean you do have a point there are uh, there are uh, that's a really old video I, I get way more hits now and I could I could probably make a much better video now just because uh, my my video skills were pretty, uh, pretty uh, basic back then. Uh, Jo says we need more Sams, Davids in every country in the world. Mm -hmm. um, not exactly Sams and Davids. Trust me, you do not want another Sam, and you do not yeah, want another David. Not. Uh, not what are issues? You want minus our issues. Yeah, yeah, minus our issues. Minus our issues. Um, so yeah, and and guys, you you know you know how that happens, right? You just you learn the material. And Sams pointed out, and I pointed out that. 
when Muslims are bringing up the same objections over and over again, you start saying what we're about to say even before we say it because you're learning the responses. Guess what? If enough Christians but, learn these responses, it's game over for Islam. Game game over, man. It's game over. Um, what are you swatting at? A fly is bothering me. Oh, really? Because uh, I have a gnat that's been yeah. going around here that's been bothering me too. That's it's funny. Been killing me. Yeah, man. It's two of them. They're coming at me. But you got someone. You got to block this guy. Who? Uh, Wyatt Kelly. He said, I, I beat my blank on Sundays because it's a holy day. Wyatt Kelly. He's, he's swearing and blaspheming. Yeah, guys, go ahead and block uh, Wyatt Kelly permanently. Uh, show, no, David, show no mercy to people like that. What's up? Muhammad Chi just hurt my feelings. He goes, Sam is obese. But was it one of Muhammad's wives, Salda bin Zama? It says she was an obese fat lady that Muhammad wanted to dump because he was not attracted to her. Yeah, so what, you what happened? <laughs> and, and, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't stop there, Sam. Don't stop there. So Sam, so so Muhammad was going to divorce her because uh, after being married to her for years, he wanted to spend more time with Aisha, his little child bride. And so uh, he was going to divorce her. And then so she went to him and said, look, I'll renounce some of my marital privileges. You don't have to spend any more time with me. You can spend all the ex all the time you would normally spend with me coming by my house. Spend that extra time with Aisha. Just please don't divorce me because your wives are not allowed to remarry after you. And so I don't want to be uh, an abandoned woman. So please, please don't divorce me. Don't kick me to the curb in my old age just because I got old and, and out of shape. Don't do that. And I'll renounce my marital privileges. Just please don't divorce me and please keep feeding me. And that's what she went to him. Now, Sam... If Muhammad had an ounce of integrity running through his body, he should have said, what are you talking about? I made a commitment to you. I'm not going to divorce you just because we get on in years. That makes no yeah. sense. I'm a man of integrity. I'm going to take care of you for the rest of my life. Of course, I'm not going to. Of course, you don't have to renounce your marital privileges. What are you talking about? I would never treat my wives unequally. But what did he actually say? He actually had another convenient revelation, David, chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 127, 128, saying, hey, that's a noble thing she did. And if any wife or any any spouses agree to that, that arrangement, Allah is all for it. So Allah said, hey, Sara, excellent idea. You know what? Muhammad, go for it. Yes, keep her around as a wife, but you don't have to visit her. So let her stay in her own home all alone. Right? Without you ever going and visiting or showing your affection. Mm -hmm. um, before uh, before I continue on the Super Chats, I see Muhammad Sheikh here says, uh, Do you know about Dark Matter 2525? All I know about Dark Matter is that he's an atheist because I've seen atheists sending me the link to it. I've never watched a video, so I don't know what his... Uh, of what his position on anything is. I do find it interesting that Muslims more and more try to are, are, are appealing to atheists. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sad, 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 sad. Uh, Sophia Film says, David, can you invite Usama Dakdok for a live show? That Sam just suggested that to me yesterday. And uh, and yep. yeah, I, and it's funny because I'd been planning to invite uh, because I go on uh, I go on Usama's uh, radio show a couple times a year. Um, but you know, now I'm doing live streams and stuff like that. Yeah. I'd have to have Usama on because, uh, he is, he, he knows the Arabic, he knows the Arabic of the Quran. And so we can have a lot of fun. Shane Fu said, John 20, 28, Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. Amen. Yep. Hallelujah. He's my Lord, my God too. We love him. We love you, Lord Jesus. Lisa, look, uh, with the super sticker here, Shane Fu says, Revelation 22, 12, I am the first and the last. Hallelujah, he is. And James. he's the one who died and lives forevermore. We love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. James Fitzgerald with a super sticker. Shane Fu, before Abraham was, I am. Man, you he's guys are going to get all. a lot of amens and hallelujahs. Uh -huh. He is the eternal one. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Odie Shu in the super chat. Radu Mamut with the super sticker. Uh, Christy C. Robinson, blessings to you both. Um, and by the way, Odishu is an Assyrian. It means slave of Jesus. So he's an Assyrian supporter, bro. That's Tatiana cool. and Odisha, you got two Assyrian supporters, man. Go ahead. Uh, James Fitzgerald posted a uh, posted something that says "game over." That's cool. I did not know that there was a game over thing. I'll use I will use that over and over again because that's uh, becoming my new favorite saying. Uh, Mon Monica Furtado with the uh, with the super sticker. All right, we made it through the super chats except for any that uh, came that were after I started. All right, Sam, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up now. Oh. But so good. we had a good crowd. We had about 1,500. Glory to Jesus. And tomorrow we're going to talk about which Bible? Ahmed Didat, which Bible? 73 and 66. Tomorrow, God willing, if the Lord Jesus wills. Mm -hmm. Right? 
Yep, yep, yep. What you want to say? Um, all right. So, yeah, we're going to – now notice, Sam, this is hilarious. Because <laughs> we're, say, we're, we're saying right now that one of the favorite issues of Muslims to bring up when we're not talking about it – in other words, once we're talking about some other topic, then they'll bring this up. But now that we say we're, we're going to actually respond – to the, to the topic they keep bringing up. They keep saying, oh, which Bible? Which Bible are you talking about? There's so many Bibles and so on. Um, now that we're finally going to talk about it, watch. They're just going to keep trying to distract everyone and going to, to different topics. No matter what, it, it, it's, I mean, it's just amazing, right? We'll say, here, we want to talk about this subject, and you'll have, a, you'll have a couple. You'll have a couple of Muslims who are actually paying attention and are trying to interact with the topic, and... Um, are following along and raising objections and so on. You'll have a couple Muslims like that. The rest of the Muslims are just trying to distract those Muslims from the actual discussion because yeah. they're trying to protect them from recognizing that Islam is false and that Christianity is true. And you can spot them because no matter what the topic is, they try to change it to another topic. Yeah. Right. So now, so so notice. I mean, we sat down. We said we're going to talk about the deity of Christ. That should be a golden ticket opportunity for every Muslim who wants to attack the deity of Christ. Instead, they bring up eighty different topics over in the chat. Now we say we're going to talk about uh, the books of the Bible. Right, the canon of the yeah. Bible. How do we get to the bottom of this? Sixty-six books or seventy-three books? How do we know? It seems that Muslims should see this as a golden opportunity to attack the Bible. What are they going to bring up? They're going to bring up, oh, Sam and Dave are liars. Sam and Dave are liars. Let's talk about Muhammad. Let's talk about the Quran. And we, we, we gladly will. We're, we're fine going off on these tangents. But wow, Sam, you got to admit, this stuff is fun, man. This stuff is fun. Man, it is. It is. It's, it's beautiful to see before my eyes Islam being destroyed and shredded. Muhammad exposed for the son of Satan, Antichrist he is. And Jesus being glorified and magnified because, folks, you cannot love Jesus enough. You cannot magnify him enough because he's God worthy of infinite praise. And may he receive what he deserves because he's worthy. And may the Lord Jesus save Muslims, keep us saved in love with him, wash us in his blood, fill us with his love, seal us by his spirit. You are the risen Lord, the Father's heart. We love you, Son of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for using sinners like us for your glory. Man, I'm excited. Yep. He bless our loved ones and our children. Amen. And everyone else in Jesus' name. All right. Uh, last comment here. Michael Rivera says, David Wood and Sam Shimon versus Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa. Topic, life of Muhammad. Would you guys do that debate? Please, someone Most set that up. In, definitely. In, in, a, in a heartbeat. We can do it right here. We do my channel. Um, happy to happy to host here on my channel. Uh, all we would need is, is, uh, is, is time limits. Can't be any rules because I know uh, certain people who... <laughs> Don't follow the rules that they agree yeah. to or that, uh, that that are imposed on me. Um, but, yeah, uh, we could uh, be happy to do that. So if they want to do that, which they won't, then, yeah, we hereby we have agreed ahead of time. All right. Thanks, everyone. And again, we'll be back tomorrow, tomorrow night, Lord, Lord willing. Lord, Lord, and Lord, just so everyone knows, because we still got uh, 1,367 people here, um, links to Sam's uh, Sam's YouTube page. Uh, Sam's YouTube channel and his website where he posts and his Patreon are all right there yeah. in the description box. So make sure you subscribe to uh, subscribe yeah. to his channel. And if you want to check out any of the other links, those are there. Yeah. All right. I keep praying for my daughters. God bless you. Take care. All right. Catch everyone tomorrow.